from the broken ruins of Babylon. This is End of Days Radio. And I'm your host, Daniel. That's D-A-N-I-E-L. Broadcasting to you all the way from that shimmering emerald city right here in the heart of the Pacific Northwest. Hold on, let me adjust my mic a little bit, get a little closer. That's better. Today's date is April 4th, 2019. Today's guest is John Hammer. John Hammer is an author. He wrote a book called The Falsification of Our Reality, Our Distorted Reality. In it, he explains how an elite bloodline has taken control of our reality and plunged us into a sea of lies. He has wrote several other books as well on similar topics as well as things within that same sort of topic. And I invite uh, invite you to check out all of his books and all of his work on Amazon. That tends to be how I get all of my books. Of course, I live in Washington State, so Amazon is really super, super big here. We get that uh, two-day shipping if you got the Prime. So lots of books, more than I could ever read in my entire life. But it's all about prioritizing, and I would say that this is a very, very important topic for everyone. And I do mean everyone, not just conspiracy heads or people of that nature. I mean everyone, everybody out there that lives on this planet Earth, if it is a planet, that is. Let's go ahead and dial up our guest. Oh, and uh, (laughs) before I get to that, remember to visit endofdaysradio.com for all things End of Days Radio. Follow me on Twitter, at Ninja Shoes or End of Days Radio. Uh, Catch me on YouTube, that's the End of Days Radio channel, as well as... There's more, I always forget. (laughs) Search us on TuneIn, on the TuneIn Radio app. Remember, it's E-O-D-R, it's not... It's not that other one, that fake end of days radio. This is the real end of days radio, the real and original. I am its true creator. So check us out on the TuneIn Radio app. That's E-O-D-R. And now let's do it. Let's get to our guest. Okay. All right. Hey, John. Hi. You know, I realized that I did not do something very important. I did not ask how to pronounce your name. Is it John Hammer or John Hamer? Hamer. Hamer. Okay, John Hamer. That's what I thought, because there's just one M. Correct. It's amazing how many people got that wrong, though. Yeah, exactly. We might as well get it cleared (laughs) up right away so it never happens again. Everybody knows who you are, and I'm very excited to talk to you the first thing I always like to ask all of my guests is, what have you been up to lately? Have you been um, doing anything interesting? Have you seen anything interesting, heard any interesting? Is your, Do you have any latest works you'd like to start us off with? Yeah, probably the latter, really. Um, I, I, I was ill, actually, most of last year. Um, fortunately, I'm a lot better now. So I, I, I've not actually done any research or writing for around about 10, 11 months. And um, I... I was sort of in the middle of a book on the JFK assassination when that happened. Uh, that's now finished and at the publishers, uh, so that should be out sometime later this month. Um, people will say, oh, JFK assassination, hasn't that been done to death? Well, yes, it has, but this is from a slightly different angle, actually. Um, I'm looking at it from the British point of view. And um, for those people who are familiar with the British crown and what it stands for and what it really stands for. And by the British crown, I don't mean the British monarchy. There is an institution called the crown, which has got its its murky hands in just about every everything that goes on in the world. And I believe it was actually the British crown that was behind the Kennedy assassination. And I go into great detail about that in my book. So it, it is from a different angle and it's not the same old stuff that gets turned out. I mean, I think, I think there's been about 20,000 books, something like that, written on the Kennedy assassination. So um, it's definitely uh, a little bit different. Well, I, I really like hearing that. that. Sorry? I really like hearing that because I think that the JFK assassination is a is a great a point that most people, whether they're into conspiracy or not, they they do know about JFK and they do have some inkling that there's some uh, some monkeying around afoot. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of monkeying around afoot. Yeah, <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> um, yeah, so you're right. It is a good starting point for for people who are just sort of coming into the world of um, I hate this phrase, but conspiracy theories. Yeah, but it is what it is. So let's call it that. You know. Um, and then, okay, so after after that book, which is, as I say, so the publishers as we speak, I'm also started writing on my sixth, my, writing my sixth book now, which is called The Falsification of Science, which is a, a sort of a follow up, a sister book to my first book, which was called The Falsification of History. Um, so basically, that's what I'm getting on with right right now. And uh, that should probably be ready mid year. So uh, we'll have to see how it goes. Is it kind of a fault? I, I imagine I can only imagine that it's a follow up to the first book, The Falsification of Our Reality. Falsification of History, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a similar theme, but it, it concentrates more on the scientific side rather than on the historical side. And basically, what they're both about is how those two subjects, history and science, have both been falsified to a large extent. I'm not saying that the entirety of history is falsified or the entirety of science is falsified, but a lot of it is. And and really, the, the book goes into what things are being falsified and why. And really, it's about, you know, control of populations and money, of course, which is, is, is the root of everything, really, as well as being the root of all evil. Um, so, yeah, it, they, they complement each other uh, in that respect. <clears throat> I love that because uh, one of my favorite books, 1984, there's a fam famous quote that comes from that book. He who controls the past controls the future. Correct. Yeah. He who controls the future cont controls the present. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, I would think that there's quite a few things. Uh, you know, the more and more I look into it, the more and more I realize that what we know is either extremely twisted or it's an outright lie. Absolutely. I mean, I, I quite often use 1984. Now you come to mention it. I quite often use that as, you know, I quote a lot from it. And uh, it's amazing how accurate that is to, in describing what today's society is really like now. Uh, and I would certainly recommend anybody who's not um, ever read 1984 or even heard of it, perhaps. Uh, that's probably a bit uh, of a stretch. But um, I would recommend anybody just picks up that book and reads it if they want an overview of what is really going on in, in the world today. Because it's so accurate. It was almost uh, <laughs> predictive of the future. Yeah, I mean, it was in a way. But then again, Orwell was an insider. He knew what was going on. He, he knew what the planned future was. He knew about the New World Order and all, and all that good stuff. Um, so it, it was predictive in a sense. But he, he did have insider knowledge. So... Um, you know, a lot of the stuff in there have been in the planning for uh, decades, if not centuries. You know, so um, he, he was, um, you know, he was quite well into uh, all that kind of thing. Because I say he was he was a uh, member of the Fabian Society, which is a British organization. Um, and that's got very close links to the elite, you know, the people who control us all. So, yeah. He, he, he did have inside knowledge, yeah. And then he also wrote, also, George Orwell, he also wrote Animal Farm, which is even even darker in a way. I think it's even darker than 1984. It is, it, absolutely. Um, but for those those people who have only ever seen the film, they made a, um, I think it was a British, uh, it was a film of, of Animal Farm, but it was uh, it was cartoon. It was a feature-length cartoon. Um, but actually, they twisted it. So the ending wasn't the same as the book. And the, and the ending was actually known to be propaganda. What, what it, it actually turned around the meaning of Orwell's work. He was, he was trying to warn against fascism, total, totalitarian fascism. But the way that the, the film was twisted was to it was warning against communism. Well, it, <laughs> You know, there is a very fine dividing line between the two, but it, it was actually twisted at the end. So um, and that was done by the powers that be, you know, to, um, to to put across a fake message, really, to, you know, to, to confuse people, to fool people, however you want to describe it. So, yeah, there's a lot of that stuff goes on, unfortunately. And at what point in your life, John, did you realize that there was something 
wrong with the world that that there was some sort of conspiracy behind the reality as we know it yeah it's a good question I, i've always felt as though um the world's not what it we really seem to be i was always a, a bit of a rebel you know at school i was always the one in trouble you know not not really bad trouble but i was a bit of a rebel and i used to uh do things that displease the teachers all the time because i i had this independent streak a mile wide you know and uh uh, so, yeah, uh, all my life I felt that something wasn't quite right. But it, it's only been in the last 20 years when I sort of really started to to look at things differently and start researching. And what kicked that off was the death of Diana. That just didn't seem right, Princess Diana. Um, and so I started reading books on that. And, st and some of the stuff that I came across just absolutely, uh, you know, I was just absolutely blown away by it, uh, you know, th th stuff that was going on, not just Diana. And then uh, so I started reading quite a few books. One of my neighbours, actually, is a is a famous British author. He's, he's not that famous that the people in America will have heard of him, but he's written one or two best selling books, uh, one of which was about MI6, which is the British Secret Service um, equivalent, in a sense, to the CIA, I guess. Um and he uh, he lent me a few books uh, <clears throat> that he'd sort of taken references from. And, and again, they just blew my mind. You know, some of the stuff that was going on in the world that I wasn't even aware of. And then when 9-11 happened, you know, about four years after Diana's death, again, you know, that just really um, you know, spoke volumes about what's, what's going on in the world and how they cover things up. And, uh, you know, obviously 9-11 was a... A massive catalyst for a lot of people but it, it was especially for me so I was quite late in life and as we mentioned before we came on air about um, the fact that the internet has been a massive catalyst for everyone in finding out you know all, all these things about what's really going on in the world and it was the same for me you know prior to the internet not not many people had access to any information that wasn't driven by the mainstream and obviously they're going to propagandize everything that they they put out there and, uh, you know, it, it until that point in time when the Internet became widely available, then it was very, very difficult to find out this sort of stuff. But ever since then, you know, in the last 20 years, 20 plus years, I've spent, you know, virtually my whole life uh, researching and writing. Uh, I actually stopped working full time in 2001 to concentrate on my research and my writing. And... Uh, it was 2002, I beg your pardon. And, uh, you know, so ever since then, like I say, I've been a full-time writer and researcher. So, it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating world for anybody who's not actually ventured into that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can, I can definitely relate to what you just said about Princess Diana. Uh, my mother was a huge fan of Princess Diana. She was, she'd buy books about her and stuff like that. And when she right. passed away, you know, it was a big thing for my family. Of course, I was paying close attention. And years and years later, um, you know, I, I was looking at some of the conspiracy stuff. And um, one thing that particularly struck out was the, the picture of the, of the driver. He looked like he was on drugs or something. Right. Yeah, I know what you mean Henry Paul. Yeah, who who killed Diana? What was it? Could the uh, Queen have been involved at all? Yeah, I mean, whether it was actually specifically the Queen, I, I think it's probably more likely the male members of the royal family, um, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. I, I definitely, the royal royalty was involved, but obviously they never get their hands dirty. It's always done by proxy, isn't it? Um, probably MI6 were involved, MI5 which is the internal security service, as opposed to MI6, which is the external, the foreign security service. The, 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 no one really knows for sure. You know, anybody who says they do know for sure is, is lying, basically. But uh, in my view, it's very, very likely that it was they that were involved, really. Yeah. And there's so many reasons for it. You know, she, she was she become a loose cannon, Diana. She was getting into all sorts of things. She was... Um, Bad mouthing Charles, her husband, um, which they don't—they don't like things like that. The royal family—they do—they do not take kindly to being criticised. Um, she'd fulfilled her <clears throat> role as a, as she put it, a brood mare. She produced, you know, the two children that, that were going to be heirs to the throne after Charles. 
And um, like I said, there were, there were other things like she was very active in anti-landmine organisations. And because she was so well loved worldwide and such as such a high profile, a lot of people were taking notice of her. And, you know, the, it didn't go down too well with arms manufacturers. <laughs> so, again, as well as the royal family, I think there was a lot of corporate vested interests involved as well. Um I mean, it's such a wide topic, you could go on talking about it for ages, but um, that's that's the basic reasons for, for why she was uh, bumped off, yeah. She was a little, bit of a, a little bit of a rebel. Yeah, she was, yeah, a bit like me. And she's you, a bit more high profile than me. <laughs> yeah. Would you say that people that are rebellious as children, they tend to grow up to be the conspiracy theorists and activists of modern day? Yeah, I do. I, I think that because I, I think they're more questioning of things rather than just accepting what they're told by the, the TV news and the radio and the newspapers, what they're reading the newspapers. I think people who are a bit more rebellious will look beyond that and start looking at things for themselves rather than just accepting whatever they're told. You know, and, and unfortunately, sort of 90, 95 percent of people in this world just believe that, oh, it's been on TV. It must be true. Or oh, I, I read it in new york times or whatever it must be true well you know i'm sorry that's just absolute nonsense they only tell you what they want you to hear and uh, they have an agenda and that agenda is keep the people who are in power the people with wealth and power in that position and the way they do that is by controlling the people and they control the people through media propaganda it might sound far-fetched to some people that but uh, trust me it is absolutely true i think that <laughs> the problem is you just don't see it if you're just going to work every day and you're watching TV. Something almost has to happen to you where you get that bird's eye view of things. Uh, maybe you go bankrupt or maybe it's a book you yeah. read or something's got to happen to make yeah. things click. That, that's right. There's got to be a catalyst. I mean, the, pro the problem is that and this is not the fault of the people because but people are so busy in their normal everyday lives they get up at seven in the morning go off to work sometimes they don't get home till six or seven in the evening all they want to do when they've, when they've got home is put their feet up grab a beer or a, a g and t or whatever to, <laughs> turns you on in that respect and perhaps just chill out to a bit of tv and they don't have time they physically don't have the time or the inclination to look beyond what is you know what what we're told is happening and look at what is really happening and that's nobody's fault other than the system. Um, it's just the way things are. Um, yeah, so. And of course, th this isn't the only part of it, but most of what we can look at and see for ourselves and prove in regards to this system of control tends to revolve around the banking system. Absolutely, it does, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the banking system again, for those people who are not aware, is totally fraudulent. The worldwide banking system is is a complete fraud. I, I watched, Coincidentally, not last night, but the night before, I watched a film which has just come out. On, I watched it on DVD called The Great British Mortgage Swindle. And it was about how the banks, for not just for decades, but for hundreds of years, especially in this country, not so much America, but... Um, have systematically swindled us with mortgages because the way that mortgages operate is is totally illegal, but it's backed up by the by the legal system. So people who try to fight against it, people who have some knowledge of the law and know that mortgages are illegal, fight against it, but they're constantly being blocked by the legal system. The legal system is completely enthralled with the banks and they conspire together. So they have a genuine conspiracy theory. Those two conspire together to actually block people from finding out what, what the real problem is. And, the, and the, the overall problem with the world financial system, again, for those people who, who don't know, and I do apologize to anybody who already knows this. Um, <clears throat> but money is created from nothing. Money is created from thin air by central banks and by uh, commercial banks in the, in the form of loans. OK, so the money that we have that we have in circulation is is doesn't really exist i know it's it's quite a difficult concept to grab hold of but um every time say for example the bank makes a loan or or agrees a mortgage what they're doing is they are creating that money 
on keyboards, on computer keyboards and keying it into their system. So if you, for example, wanted to borrow $100,000 for a mortgage, all the bank does is type in a one and, and, and five zeros into, into your account and say, OK, that, that's, that's your money. Well, it's not really money. It's just electronic digits. But then they have the audacity to charge you interest on that. And what's even worse, if you don't pay those interest payments and the capital payments, they, they've they given you this money which has no real substance, no real value. But if you don't pay the the uh, instalment, then they will come and take away your house, which does have a value. And that's how they make their billions, their trillions <clears throat> year on year, because they're constantly they're lending money that doesn't exist. They're charging you interest on money that doesn't exist. And if you don't pay that interest, they're taking away your house and selling it and making money that way, too. So the whole system is completely fraudulent. I, know, very, I noticed with the, the housing that they tend to keep the price of a house just barely above what the average person can afford. That's got to be a big part of it. Yeah, that's true. That does happen. I'll tell you something else that they do as well, especially in the States. I've not heard it so much in this country. But in order to maintain the high cost of housing, even though there are so many people homeless and there are, you know, especially in the States, again, I think um, several million people are now homeless. And so in order to keep the demand, they are burning houses that they repossess because they've worked out that it's actually um, by keeping those house prices high artificially and not allowing supply and demand to take its natural course, they're actually making more money by burning valuable houses than they would be for keeping them on the market, because that would actually drop the prices, and then that would mean that people wouldn't need to borrow as much in mortgages, so they wouldn't make as much money as they would by actually burning a valuable house that a homeless person could be living in. And if that doesn't sum up what the state of today's society is, I don't know what else does. You know, it's absolutely disgusting, really. But that's just a tiny, tiny example of, of, of the whole uh, m- m- vast conspiracy that, of, of what is going on and the way we're controlled. It's got to be <laughs> surrounded. It's got to be surrounding the housing market, because if you look back when we had the big economic crash back in the early 2000s um, here in this yeah. country, George W. Bush, Bush, you know, the George Bush Jr., the second one, yeah. He, he, yeah, yeah. he blamed the housing market for all of our problems at the time. That shows you how closely everything is tied. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, probably. I mean, I, I, I didn't re- I don't really uh, subscribe to that personally, but <laughs> whether or not the, he had some sort of um, – ulterior motive shall we say for saying that i don't, I don't know but uh, you know I, the, the the only blame that i would attach to anything that's going on is the people who, who run us all you know with a as i like to say with, with an iron fist encased in a velvet glove um you know the people that i don't and i don't mean the politicians i don't mean the presidents and the prime ministers i mean the people who control them the people who sit above them the, the billionaires and the trillionaires that we never get to hear about these these and nameless people who who sit above us and uh, and pull the strings of, of people like presidents and prime ministers. It's those who I blame, not nothing to do with the, the housing market, really. It was uh, an excuse. It was an excuse he, he was giving us. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who really who really owns the banking system? Um, well, there's, there are several prominent people. Um, again, they the may not be familiar to everybody, the names, but some of them will be. Um, it's mainly the Rothschild family and the Rockefeller family in the States and uh, people like the royal family, um, the British royal family and all the royal families of Europe do have hands in it as well. Um, but the thing is, we're never really told. This is only supposition, you know. Um, because people think that institutions in you know, central banks like the Federal Reserve Bank, um, like the Bank of England and all the other hundreds of central banks throughout the world, people think that they're actually owned by the government or controlled by the government. Well, they're not. They're run by rich billionaire, trillionaire families. And um, 
you know, again, this is something about the monetary system that is fraudulent, and that is that um, every dollar in circulation, every pound over here in circulation, <clears throat> is lent to the government at interest. The government do not produce it themselves. They have to go cap in hand to the Federal Reserve if they want to put another, say, another $100 million into circulation. They have to go cap in hand to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve will then allow them to print that money, um, but they owe the Federal Reserve $100 million uh, plus interest for that money. And that in interest has to be paid back some way or another. And the only way that interest can be paid back is by printing more money. And then that comes with its own interest attached as well and so on. And, it, and it's an ever increasing spiral. And that's why we have inflation. It's nothing to do with foreign trade deficits or, or depressions or, or any of that other guff that these talking head economists come out with on TV or on the radio. That's all complete nonsense. The reason for inflation is the fact that government has to go cap in hand and borrow money to actually put into circulation. And that's how the Fed, that's how the central bank system works. And as I say, it's owned by faceless people. We never get to know who the real stockholders of that company is. Uh, we know the faces of them uh, in terms of who, you know, who comes on TV and, and, and is the head, the nominal head of the Federal Reserve or the nominal head of the Bank of England and come, comes out with all these proclamations and pronouncements about the economy and all this stuff. But they're not really the people who own it all. As I say, the people who own it are the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the trillionaire families of this world. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's been an interesting phenomena that has happened probably in the last uh, five to ten years where a lot of people that work for the, the banking system, they're committing suicide, throwing themselves out of windows, all kinds of crazy stuff. It, it really makes you scratch your head. What's going on where these people want to kill themselves? Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. To be fair, it's not just in the banking industry. It's in a lot of industries. But I think specifically in the banking industry, these people probably know too much about what's going on. Or they've started asking questions of the wrong people in the wrong places about what's really going on. Because don't forget, a lot of these people, they don't actually know what I've just sort of relayed to you. They don't actually know that this is going on. So sometimes they accidentally find out these things and then they will start asking questions or they will start telling other people, did you know that, you know, this is how it works? Can you believe this? You know, it's, it's this and it's not that at all. We've been told this and it's not that. And then, of course, um, they get what's called suicided because, you know, the people who know too much have no place in this mad world that we live in. Um, they really don't, you know. Um, you know, the likes of you and I, if our profiles were any larger, then we would be in serious danger. There are a lot of people who, who do the stuff that we do, who, who live in fear of their lives every day. And, you know, fortunately, I'm not in that position. Um, unfortunately, you're not either, I guess. But uh, it's a sad fact of life. And this happens in all industries, not just banking. There was a big space, just, just by way of an example, there was a, a big space of similar things in the 1980s in the UK with um, fence contractors. Um, so people who work for, for companies like um, Marconi and Plessy Systems and things like that, they were committing suicide by the hundreds. And it, I actually had a personal experience of it, not, not, uh, you know, not, not myself, but I actually knew someone. I worked for a, a software company at that time. I, I was uh, in computing. And uh, one of my colleagues, who was a uh, programmer, computer programmer, he worked for, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the company now, um, but it was a company that built um, submarines in the north of England in a place called Barrow in Furness. And um, he was driving home one night. He worked there sort of on a more or less semi-permanent basis, and he was driving home one night. And so the story went. He was driving up the motorway, the freeway, motorway as we call them um and about halfway home he he went up the exit ramp off the freeway the motorway and he went round the roundabout at the top of it and then he came back down the same ramp that had gone up and he was and he drove in the opposite direction down the wrong lane 
OK, so, you know, within about two minutes, he was involved in a head on collision with another car and they were both killed. Now, the story that the police told us when they came to the office to break the bad news was that um, he'd been working long hours and he was tired. Now, you just accept that, don't you? And I, I did. And it was only a few years later when I thought about it. I thought, does tiredness really make someone do something like that? Um I can't imagine that it would. If you're tired, you you fall asleep at the wheel. You don't you don't drive up a ramp and then around a roundabout and then back down the same ramp, travelling in, in the wrong direction down a down a highway. Um, so you know a lot of people are, are killed like that with with accidents in cars. And you might say, well, how did they achieve that? Well, there are different ways of achieving it, and some of it is is through mind control. And I believe that you know that happens a lot. And uh, it was at that time, uh, as I say, in the 1980s, that, that guy would have known a lot of the defence secrets. Yeah. And there was all sorts of things going on. And, 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 it, and he wasn't alone. There were there were literally dozens and dozens of other people who who met their ends in very strange ways, um, like people going and jumping off bridges and, and things like that. It, just all very, very strange. Um, but it certainly goes on. There's no doubt about it. In all industries, like I say. These uh, people that are doing the assassination, they must be highly skilled because you can look at uh, two of them, uh, the the assassination of Diane, of course, which I feel is the assassination, yes. and, and JFK, of course. Um, maybe not JFK himself where it was uh, you know, questionable what happened, but there's so many people surrounding the whole JFK ordeal that also went missing, and oh, those yeah. cases didn't really get looked into like they should have. What, whatever these Absolutely. assassins are doing, they are highly skilled, highly skilled. Absolutely. I mean, take JFK as a good case in point, actually. Um, I found, uh, when I was writing the book, um, I found at least 230 people it might have been slightly more than that, but at least 230 who within the two to three years after Kennedy's assassination uh, died in very strange circumstances. And, you know, there were no autopsies or anything like that of these people. They were just proclaimed to have died of a heart attack or died in a plane crash or died in a car crash. You know, and nothing was ever really, as you say, investigated at all. And, and there were at least 230 of these people. And I list them in the book, to be frank. Um, some of them, not all of them. Um, it, it's just amazing. And whenever anything like that like, like that happens, there's a, there's a whole spate of, in quote marks, suicides and and strange deaths. It's just a fact of life uh, because you know they have to cover these things up because they don't want the real truth to get out, and they and they don't care what ends they go to to do it. And like you say, there's a lot of skill involved in in doing that. Another great example. <laughs> would be the uh, Clinton family, people <laughs> yes. disappearing left and right. Mm. Yeah, that's another, that, that's amazing. I mean, the amount, the, well, they call it the Clinton body count, don't they? And I would urge anyone to just Google that expression, Clinton body count, and just see what comes up. And it's absolutely incredible. There are so many people who've been close to the Clintons who who never lived to tell the tale, as they say. It's just uh, it's just extraordinary. And if anybody just, you know, says to me that that is a coincidence, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'd, I'd, I'd have to laugh because that is just, um, you know, there's just too, far too many. And in similar circumstances, a lot of them. Um, and then, of course, because they kill that person, then they have to kill others to to cover that one up. And so it goes on. It's like a it's like a, a chain, like a chain reaction. And um, yeah, it goes on all the time. Very sad, but very true. And what's really <laughs> sick and cold hearted, one of the guys that disappeared was one of Bill's friends. I think his last name was Foster, Vincent Foster, something like that. Vince Foster, yeah. Oh, yeah, Vince Foster, absolutely, yeah. These, these Clintons and probably most of these people that are involved in the system, they have no soul. They're just completely cold hearted. They'll just order somebody's death on a whim. Yeah, well, they're psychopaths. I mean, they are, they are brought up to be psychopaths. Um, again, it might sound strange to people, but it's absolutely true. And it doesn't take much more than a, a little bit of research to see that these generational families, as I call them, these 
these generational r ruling elite families bring their children up to be psychopaths the way that they, they raise them um, in psychopathic psychopathic behavior because that's the only way they can continue the family di dynasties and make and keep control um, is by brainwashing them into these psychopathic monsters that they become when I mean, the, you're right. We could. This is why people don't believe that this goes on, because we tend. What we tend to do as humans is we tend to assume that everyone has the same feelings and and behavioural instincts as we do, uh, and most people do. It's only that tiny percentage of us who are psychopaths who don't have any uh, remorse, any empathy over their actions. Uh, people can't understand that. People can't because everybody. You know, like you or I, or like the good people listening to this this program now, um, it, we we couldn't begin to comprehend how people can behave like that. And so the, this the assumption is that well, no, people don't behave like that. Well, unfortunately, they do, and you know that's been proven many many times. In regards to something that you mentioned earlier one thing that i tried to do at one point was i tried to trace and find out who actually is in control and who owns the federal reserve here in here in america and it's very obfuscated it's very hidden it's it's hard to really yeah. tie things together all you see are um their shares and we don't know who owns them exactly and it, yeah it's the same over here the bank of Ling england is exactly the same um, you know who the, the the nominal head is, but you don't know who owns it. Um, you know, the, the, the people at the top, like, uh, I can't remember who's the head of the Federal Reserve now, but I remember a few years ago, it was a guy called Ben Bernanke. They're just figureheads. They're just, they're just talking heads that, um, you know, are wheeled out to say the right things at the right time. But not, they're not the people who own it. They're not the stockholders. They're not the shareholders. It's just the way things are, and, and you'll never, ever get to the bottom of it. I mean, some researchers have made certain assumptions about who they are, who they are and, and quite plausible assumptions, and, and they're, they're the ones that I tend to go along with. But, um, you know, when I was talking about people like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and, and the royal family, there is no out-and-out -out proof, but there is some circumstantial evidence that that's the case, yeah. And I believe that probably why some of these people are committing suicide or being assassinated it's because they come from a place of authority and if they were to go on the radio or some form of media and actually talk about it people would actually believe them because of their place in the system yeah some would no doubt um but uh, again you know they have this other weapon that they use against things like that and that is this ridiculing people um turning it into a joke you know it, it, very occasionally on on tv not that i watch tv really but very occasionally s several years ago when i used to watch the news programs um you see people come on who've got this you know really important uh nugget of information to share which which actually uh goes against the the, the mainstream view and they will be shot down in flames absolutely and and they, they do that a lot as well. And and as well as, you know, anybody that does escape through the net of, of, of that close control, trying to prevent them from speaking out, anybody that actually does escape, they're, they're just ridiculed. Are they called conspiracy theorists, which is it's become a derogatory term. But really what a conspiracy theorist is, is someone who's actually done some research and has come to the conclusion that, the real the story that we're, we're being told is not the real story, but but that's how we're dismissed because everybody it's now become sort of inured in in people's psyches that oh conspiracy theorists you know he's he's just a tinfoil hat geek you know and and that's how people regard such as we who, who you know who do our research and not just take things as 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 they're stated by the mainstream. So there's different ways that they. You know, they handle that whistleblowing, if you like. You would think that people would be out of the streets rioting like crazy because of this. Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch that, Daniel. So can you repeat? Oh, no worries. 
there's just a little bit of feedback. I'm trying to talk slow, but you would think that people would be out in the streets going absolutely crazy, breaking windows, uh, starting fires, absolutely going crazy about this, but you don't see one riot about it. You don't see one demonstration, maybe a few people on the stairs of the Capitol one day, but other than that, you see absolutely nothing. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, it does go on, but of course, um, you know, they don't want you to know it's going on, so they cover it up. I mean, a good um, a good example of that was what's been going on in Europe. I don't know how much has filtered through in the States, but it, it, it's been censored on the BBC because in France there's been a massive uprising against the EU, the European Union. Um, you know, we, we in Britain here, we're in the middle of Brexit, as it's called, the British exit from the European Union, which I have severe doubts that will ever, ever happen, but that's another story. But what's been going on in France is that there's been massive mass demonstrations and there's been millions of people turning out protesting against the EU. And of course, the, the powers that be send in the heavy brigade, you know, the, the armed police and the riot police and all the rest of it. But very, very little of it is being reported. And that's how it works. They don't want you to know that people are, are dissatisfied because it might encourage other people to do the same. So they keep it out of the news as much as they can. They can't keep it out completely, but they do a lot of censorship of that kind of activity that is going on. So it does go on, like, but like you say, we never see it. <laughs> or very rarely see it anyway. Another thing that they seem to do, well, one thing that I know that they're doing is there's this whole thing about the queen, the royal families, the banking families, they're labeled as aliens, as hybrids, uh, a reptilian hybrids, like some sort of alien race that came to our planet and took over. And in my opinion, it's part of that ridicule because if they can get people talking about that stuff or, or yeah. put uh, agents out there talking about that stuff, it just yeah. renders the whole entire thing. It, it destroys all credibility. Exactly. That's It's called the straw man argument, isn't it? They set up uh, these fake um facts these fake uh scenarios that they know they can knock down and when they knock those down they're knocking everything else down that is true so yeah absolutely i agree with that and you know that that is done all the time that that is a common tactic you know to set up a a as you say a scenario whereby they're all family are all all alien lizards or whatever the the uh the generally accepted thing is in in certain circles and then they can just ridicule everything. So if we then say uh, the royal family are this, the royal family are that, you know, we're put in the same category as people who say that they're, they're reptilians. Yeah, so I absolutely agree. That's how it works. And sadly, I, I actually believed that stuff at one point. I'm embarrassed about it now, but it, it really took me in. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... The thing is, there's so much, you know, again, for anybody who's, who's researching, I, I'll offer this warning. And that is not only is a lot of good information out there, but there's an equal or perhaps a possibly larger amount of information that is is not right, is disinformation. And it's put there to, to put people off the track, to put people off the scent of what's really going on and to actually make that distinction between what is information and what is disinformation is very, very difficult. And at the end of the day, sometimes you just have to go by your own gut feeling on what you believe and what you don't believe or what you think is plausible and what you think is not plausible. Uh, and it's not easy, you know, so be careful. <laughs> Would you say that this is a form of slavery? Are we all slaves? Absolutely we are, yeah. And, and they've got it off to a fine art as well. Um, you know, there are... As, as the old saying goes, there are none so hopelessly enslaved as those who believe they are free. I can't remember who it was it's, that said it, but it was a very wise man. And um, yeah, it's true. You know, we're, we're 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 slaves in the sense that we are we are monitored from you know waking up in the morning to going to sleep at night. Um, we are controlled because we have to go unless you're very lucky and have your own small business or you're independent in some other way or off grid you are totally dependent on the system for your health wealth and well-being um if you don't have a job and earn money you cannot live in a house you cannot have a drive a car you cannot have a passport you cannot have a driving license 
the whole system is is actually geared up to entrap you into conforming to what they want you to conform to and it's it's you know the more it took me a while to grasp it actually because it's quite a an odd concept we think we live in the land of the free and all and all that good stuff but unfortunately we don't we are controlled from morning till night by by this system that has us in this iron grip and you know it, it it, you can't escape it. I mean, for example, taxation. You know, again, it's a it's a it's a famous saying, but taxation is theft. Who gives a government or a local government the right to take money from us? You know, for whatever reason they choose. Why can't I just say, okay? But they'll say, you know, oh well, your taxation goes to cover this, goes to cover that, goes to cover the other. I mean, that is nonsense, but that's that's a separate issue. Um, all your taxation goes to is to pay the central bank, by the way, pay the interest on the money that they put into circulation. But that's another story for another time, perhaps. Um, but what the, you know, what they tell you is completely wrong. And, you know, it, you, you cannot say, well, OK, I, I don't want to drive on roads, so I don't want to pay tax that goes towards fixing the roads. I, you know, I, I never use libraries, so I don't want to pay tax that goes to pay public libraries. You can't do that. You cannot opt out. So to me. That's nothing more or less than slavery. You know, you're being told that we're going to take money off you and we're going to use that money for X, Y, Z, whether you like it or not. And I'm sorry, you can't opt out the system unless you go and live in a cave somewhere in the in the middle of the Rockies or whatever. You know, it's um, the whole system is just geared to that form of slavery. It's funny because whenever they talk about how much we owe they never actually mention who exactly we owe <laughs> yeah well that who who we owe is the central banks is the banking system and this is why i believe and again it, it, i cover this in massive detail in in my book behind the curtain and the bank behind the curtain is about it's not just about the banking system but it's about how the banking system generates so much money um, that it gives it the power to control almost everything else. And again, that might sound fantastic to some people, but it, it, it's true. Um, the banking system is the, is the core of the whole conspiracy, if you like. It, it generates so much money that it gives them the power to control everything else, corporations, governments, everything. And, and that is exactly what happens. But again, by the banking system, I don't want people to run away with the idea that it's like, you know, the local bank manager or or even the guy who's the head of the bank. It is the people who own the bank. And, it, you know, it, it, what we're saying about the Federal Reserve people, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, it's all these people that are that are 12 major families. Please don't ask me to recite them because I can't remember off the top of my head. But there are 12 major families who control and run everything including the banking system, but the banking system is the key element in the whole damned conspiracy, if you like. Are the Jews or Jesuits <laughs> behind it all? Um, I think there is a lot of Jewish influence, but I, d I don't think you can't sort of put your finger on, say, it's a Jewish conspiracy or a, or a Jesuit conspiracy. I think each of those elements are involved, um, but there is a lot of, uh, shall we say, undue influence from those groups, not just in the banking system, but throughout the whole of society, too much, in my view. And they are definitely, along with other groups, I have to say, you know, manipulating us into this, you know, their, what their uh, goal is in, in, over the next few decades is something called the New World Order, which is a phrase that some people may have heard of because it, um, you know, presidents and prime ministers and politicians use it all the time in their speeches. Uh, but it's almost like a throwaway comment to most people, you know, oh, new world order. Yeah, what does that mean? I don't know. Well, it sounds, sounds reasonable, new world order. Yeah, that sounds quite benign and, and fun, but it's not. What they're aiming for is a what, what called a new world order, uh, and that is a, a central world government governed by a central world police force. And, and it won't be very benign, trust me. They are looking to really, really control everyone in the most insidious of ways. 
Um, and as I say, it is, yeah, you can say there's a massive Jewish, Jewish influence, which there is, especially in the States. <clears throat> uh, there's a, the, I, I'm not sure about Jesuit. And I, I read a lot of stuff about Jesuit influence, but I don't know whether that's a blind again. You know, I don't know whether that is a, 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 a false trail, if you like. Um, but, you know, there, there are other influential groups as well. But, uh, yeah, they're certainly involved. One thing that's particularly <laughs> scary and disturbing about this situation is that these same people, they seem to own all of the media, all of the news, all of the entertainment. Uh, they own all of Hollywood. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And it is very it's not it's not healthy. There's absolutely no no two ways about it. You know, one any one group or any two groups or any, even any three groups that own that the amount of influence that they own is not a healthy situation and it's not the way things ought to be at all. It's um, it's not good. And another big part of this, another along with the media and the banking, would have to be energy as well. I'm sure we've all heard of the tales of the guy that's running a lawnmower on a, a teaspoon of uh, gas and the rest is water, or we hear about these uh, free energy sort of inventions. Yeah. Or it's close to it. Yeah, absolutely. It? In fact, you know, I, I'm just writing my book, Falsification of Science, almost as we speak. I've just written a, a, a few more paragraphs today. And uh, one of the, the chapters that I'm working on at the moment is the one on free energy. And, and it's amazing. There's so, there's so many different things that we never get to know about because obviously, you know, if they became in, in common use, if they suddenly um, were developed and, and uh, you know, distributed widely throughout the world, which they could easily be, then that will cut off the, the financial supply to lots of very powerful invested interests, such as big oil, for example. Um, I was I was writing a little bit earlier today. I was I can't remember. Was it yesterday? It doesn't matter anyway. About uh, a guy called Stan Mayers. Uh, and he was an American guy who invented a water powered car. And again, if people want to look on YouTube, there are, there are YouTubes about this. Stan was a very clever guy. He was an engineer and he invented this water powered car that would run 100 miles on a gallon of water and would do 100 plus miles an hour. So it wasn't just a, you know, uh, a piddling little invention that, that, that was not very practical. This was a proper working car that ran on water. Now, Stan was, wasn't a wealthy man. He was trying to get backing uh, for someone to get, bring this car into production. And he was contacted by these, 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 these guys who purported to be um, uh, part of a big manufacturing company that were interested in taking on board his invention and, um, you know, running with it. So it, it, the upshot of it was they arranged to meet and they were meeting in a restaurant and Stan and his brother went to meet these two guys in this restaurant, not really knowing who they were. And about halfway through the meal, Stan took a drink from his water glass and then ran out into the street in agony, collapsed on the pavement and died. And his brother went out to see him, uh, to help him. And as he was lying there trying to you know, revive Stan, these two guys calmly walked out the restaurant and passed him down the sidewalk without even a backward glance or a word. And, you know, that was it. That was the end of poor old Stan. And his patent still exists, but nobody has dared to pick it up and run. And the reason why is that big oil interests are so powerful. They still, can you imagine the impact that a water powered car would have on the world economy? It would just it would just change it overnight. And so many rich vested interests will be left penniless. How do you suppose you that suppose? these people gain control in the first place? You mean like people who run the big oil and all that stuff? Yeah. How did they get such a stranglehold on our lives like this? Yeah, it's a good question. But again, it's part of the same conspiracy, isn't it? These people these same small group of people run everything. So once you've actually achieved that position of, of being that position of power where you have all this control over people, it's very easy to introduce new things. Like, so, for example, before oil 
was became a necessity, a vital necessity to our lives, other than for uh, using in oil lamps, um, you know, 120 odd years ago or whatever. Um, the, per- the person who suddenly decided to develop that, that uh, cars and therefore you know, g- generate this need for oil, um, they are bought out at very early stages. So that is somehow incorporated into this already existing umbrella group that looks over everything. So they will take things as they as they become available and use them. They, they, they spot an opportunity like, great, yeah, well, somebody's just invented this fantastic horseless carriage. Let's, um, you know, uh, but it needs oil to run it. Oh, right. Well, that's, you know, that's something for the future. We need to buy into oil. We need to we need to be, you know, aware of this need there's going to be for oil. So they're very forward thinking people in that way. And that's how it's done. It's just done on a piecemeal basis, on a gradual basis. It's not sort of it doesn't sort of happen overnight. It happens gradually, but it's through their foresight, because let's not forget these people that we're dealing with. They're not stupid. They're very, very intelligent people, very, very, very intelligent psychopaths. And that's a deadly combination. Does this system (laughs) extend (laughs) into the Eastern (laughs) world? Is it in China as well? Yeah, but not as strong. It's mainly the Western world, the China and, you know, places in the, the Middle East and the East, not so much the Middle East, but certainly the East, China, India, that kind of place. They they are controlled to a certain extent by Western economies, if you like. But there's a, there is also a lot of independent local stuff that goes on there. For example, and a good example of that, I would say, would be Chinese medicine. Uh, my son was out in China. My son's a professional dancer and he and he went on a tour uh, of China last year and he was out there for three months and he experienced Chinese medicine, for example, um, firsthand. And they don't use what we call the Western Rockefeller based medicine over here, i.e. using pharmaceutical chemicals to cure diseases um they don't do that they've got their own methodology of doing that and they actively resist western medicine because that's not the way they do it it's more natural the way they do it whereas we think that drugs and and all that stuff is is the right way to do it uh, i don't believe it is and again that's all in my books all that, all the stuff about health and medicine um so that's just another example so yes to a certain extent they are controlled by Western corporations, but they also have this this sort of partial independence as well in the way that they operate things. Um, I suspect eventually they'll succumb to it all, but at the moment, no, they, they, they are slightly more independent than we are. Is Britain <laughs> the centre of this? Would it be considered yeah. a power base? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, all you Americans out there, I mean, this is not me as a uh, as a Brit, you know, bragging or boasting or anything like that. Um, but unfortunately, America is called, controlled by Britain and people throw their hands up in horror and say, no, that's not true. We got our independence in 1776 and we've been independent ever since. Well, no, I'm sorry you haven't. Um, it's an actual fact that. US, the US is and always has been controlled by Britain, which sounds really strange. I mean, Britain is, is a, I don't like it. I'm not saying that as a Briton, like I say, I'm bragging about it because I'm, you know, I think the whole system is completely wrong, uh, and broken. But again, if anyone wants to Google the British influence on the US, even to this day, and what actually happened in 1776, there was a declaration of independence, but it was only done under certain conditions. And it, and it enabled King George III, who was the king at the time in England, Britain, to retain control. And also, again, it's very, very complex. And I, I don't want to sort of, it'll take me a long time to explain it in massive detail. But something happened in the States in 1871 where the Constitution was rescinded. And again, people can Google that if they wish. If people say, well, the, the guy's talking a load of garbage, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. We have a constitution. Of course we do. Yes, you do. But it's not the original constitution. The original constitution was rescinded in 1871 and replaced by a constitution in all capital letters, which 
actually puts the US under maritime law. And that's why you get um, in, in courtrooms and, uh, and in the military, the US flag, Stars and Stripes, always has a gold fringe around it. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have noticed that, but not really sort of taking it on board. But what that signifies is that you come under maritime law and maritime law is controlled by Britain. Uh, and again, that's another part of the control mechanism that um, they have over all of us. But it's a very long and convoluted story, that. But I would urge anyone who's listening to to actually Google that because it's a very interesting story and it's a very eye opening story as well, as well as shocking. It's quite shocking. Yeah, one thing that shocked me in particular was when I was researching uh, pirating and, you know, all those famous pirates and ships and all that stuff. I, I was yeah. shocked to find that it's actually linked to the whole system of England yeah. and the banks and the secret societies and all of that very yeah. closely linked. These weren't just random hooligans. These were people that were sent out to go do these things. Absolutely. They were, they were controlled by the government, all these pirates. Yeah, you know, they were, yeah, uh, as you say totally controlled by the establishment and this is something... so... oh go ahead sorry no i was just gonna say there's, there's so many other things like that they're all intrinsically linked and i always look at it like a um, like a jigsaw puzzle and we cannot see the full picture until we've got a lot of the pieces in place and then suddenly this picture starts to appear and not only does that picture appear but that then it enables us to put more and more and more pieces into place and, you know, that that is exactly what goes on when you first start down this road, you and I are on that the, the, the jigsaw puzzle is empty. There's nothing there. But eventually we start to put one or two pieces together and then a few more and then a few more. And then all of a sudden you just think, wow, yeah, there's the picture. I've got it. I understand it. And this is, these are all the different elements. These are all the different pieces in the puzzle. And that's uh, that's how it works. And you brought up 9-11 earlier. Were these same people responsible? And why the heck would they do that? Why would they kill so many people? Uh, well, the psychopaths, they don't care. <laughs> you know, it's nothing to them. It's just, you know, you've heard the old mafia uh, saying, haven't you? It's just business. It's nothing personal. You know, and they excuse themselves with that. And, and to a psychopath, the end always justifies the means. Always. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the people who did 9-11 were the, the American government were colluded in it, um, obviously. I think most people are sort of aware of that. Um, but I believe it was Israel that did 9-11. Israel did 9-11 because they wanted America and the, the American, pub, American public opinion on board for attacking the Middle East. Because who benefits from the U.S. going into um, Iraq and Syria and Libya? And Lebanon or wherever else they're going, who benefits from that mostly? It's Israel, because Israel is trying to become the center of the new world order. So that's where you get the Jewish influence, if you like, um, because it's um, because it's Israel who is the, cat the, the, the is the catalyst. And that's why Israel was created in the first place. To be the catalyst for the new world order. Are we? Are we headed towards a one world currency and if so if so how soon do you think that would happen sorry again i lost you there daniel oh sorry it's the feedback again uh my it's question okay. it seems to disappear the more i talk but what are right. uh are we headed towards a one world currency and if if so how soon do you see that happening and would it be in the form of a e-currency yeah, I, I honestly don't know. Um, <laughs> I think that they're trying to make everything a one world something or other. So, yeah, a, a one world currency sounds feasible and plausible. Um, quite what the impact that would have is I wouldn't like to guess. It could well be something like a a cryptocurrency, is what you mean by an e-currency. Um, something like Bitcoin, which is obviously the, the biggest one at the moment, uh, but there are lots of other smaller ones coming along. Um, but again, the problem with that is that the banks are about five years behind the game on cryptocurrency. So um, 
you know, I think eventually the banks will get into cryptocurrency and, and they will also find another way of retaining control of the world's economy. Because the problem with cryptocurrency for them is, which is why they don't like it, is that it removes that control from themselves. They don't have the ability uh, to uh, to hold the, the power that they do over us at the moment with cryptocurrency because they don't have any cryptocurrency. That is a, a completely independent currency and it takes away their power. So I can't really answer the question, but it's an interesting one. Yeah. Do you believe in revelation or prophecy at all? Um, do you mean the bi- biblical revelation? Yes. Um, Sort of. <laughs> I'm not a Christian. I'm not. Uh, I'm not religious. Um, I'm not not mainstream religious. I'm I'm spiritual, um, and I do believe that parts of the Bible are actually a history book rather than a religious book, or both. Um, but there is a lot of stuff in the Bible that is is very very accurate in describing our history, as opposed to our uh, mainstream history. Uh, but Revelation. I can't say that to be with with my hand on my heart that I've actually ever read Revelation, so I don't really know what what it is other than the generalized version of it, where it's all where everything comes to a fire and brimstone ending and all that sort of stuff. So I, th- I would say probably on balance, no, I don't believe it. In your opinion, is it better to try to work within the system and get ahead as an individual? Or would it be better to try to band together and tear the entire monetary system down? Well, obviously the latter, as far as I'm concerned. But, I mean, everybody will have different opinions on that. You know, some people um, feel that they cannot do it. I mean, I I have people say to me, you know, I go around different places giving talks and things like that on various different topics, various aspects of the the, the huge conspiracy, if you like. Um, People... Have said to me, well, you know, I, I can't contribute. What can I do? You, you, you're a writer, you're a researcher, you, you do this full time. You know, I work 60 hours a week or whatever. I just don't have the time to do this. How can I contribute? How can, how can I become part of that? And I just say to them, well, you know, you know, everybody can only do what they can do. I said, if you if you can, can contribute in, a, in, a, in a, any way, however small, such as just even, for example, making people aware of what's going on that's fine that, that's your contribution so yeah it's great if people can do that and i obviously believe that i would rather everybody band together and, and do stuff like that uh, rather than just as you say knuckle down and and bury themselves in the system because that you know that's only going to perpetuate it isn't it that's not going to uh, that's not going to make our problems go away that's going to you know exacerbate them really that makes sense Uh, yes definitely you you could become one of the biggest perpetrators of this whole thing simply by trying to become really successful and getting rich yeah absolutely yeah good point and in regards to some of the stuff we were talking about with these assassinations uh you mentioned they might be using technology are these elite these Big bankers, these families, are they hiding technology, some advanced stuff that we can only dream of? Absolutely. Well, we just talked very briefly about water-powered car. I know that's not a, an assassination weapon, but it, nevertheless, it is technology that is being hidden. There's so much other technology that's being hidden, free energy technology. Um, you know, according to the laws of physics, free energy is not possible. But I'm sorry. Well, it, it, you know, there are there are several examples to disprove that glib statement. You know, so there is a lot of technology that are, there is being hidden from us because they uh, it, either it's a threat to their financial well-being or they want to keep it for themselves, for example. You know, there are there are all sorts of things. I mean, there are rumors about things as well, um, you know, that actually exist, things like um Anybody who might have heard of a, a guy called Bob Lazar, who was a whistleblower from Area 51. Um, again, I'm not absolutely 100 percent. I believe everything that Bob said, but it's, it's interesting. Nevertheless, I mean, he he had access to uh, back engineered flying saucers, you know, he claims. And, and he does seem quite a credible guy, to be fair. But I suppose what he's telling us is hard to believe. But 
there is all sorts of hidden technology around. Absolutely. Uh, again, I, this is not really a plug for my book, but it, I do cover a lot of that in, in my various books, you know, the different kinds of technology that are out there that are not widely known or, or distributed, you know. John, your gut, what does it say is at the very top of this pyramid? Who's who's the most in control? Who's at the very top? Could it be aliens or Lucifer, maybe? Uh, no, I think it's more earthly than that. I think it's, um, as I said before, I think it's the, the British royal family and the Rothschilds who are the real apex of the pyramid. Again, it's only my view. You know, I, I'm I'm very open minded. If somebody came to me and, and gave me some, you know, some information that said, yeah, Lucifer's at the top of the pyramid, then, you know, I, I could work very well believe it, assuming that, that that fitted in with, you know, what I what I researched about it. Um, so, yeah, I'm always prepared to to be open minded about things and change my mind. I, you know, I have done several times on several different topics over the last 20 years. When when you first come into this world, you know, as you said earlier, you start believing things. You start you start believing things that you read because you think that it's it's true. But then you realize it was just disinformation. So, you know, I think it's essential that anybody who wants to enter this world, this world of conspiracy. Um, and it's certainly not an easy world to be in. But uh, um, anyone who wants to enter it has got to be open minded and got to be prepared to look at the facts and change the mind if necessary and not be dogmatic about things. So, you know, that's just my view. If, um, you know, if someone comes to me and says, well, you've been mistaken all, all along, John, because look, look, here's the facts. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. I'd be more than willing to look at those facts and, and change my mind if I f- felt it was uh, right to do so. Does the queen herself still have much more power than we realize? And if so, who's going to succeed her? Who comes next after her? Again, I missed a little bit there. Who who were you talking about? Oh, no worries. I was talking again about the queen of England. I was asking, does she have a lot more power to this day than we realize? And who's going to succeed her? Who comes next after her? Okay, without a doubt, she has much more power than we believe. Um, you know, people, you know, say to me, "Oh, the royal family, yeah, they don't really have any power. They're just figureheads. You know, it's just a tradition. It's just, it's just for tourism. You know, everybody comes to England to see the, you know, the Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle and all, all this stuff." Um, but no, they, they have a very, very, they, they have a very iron grip on what's going on. She has the power, for example, to dismiss a prime minister if she chose to use it. Uh, that's never been rescinded. And she did that in Australia in the 70s. A guy called Guff Whitlam, who was prime minister of Australia in the 1970s, he got a bit too liberal for her liking. He was doing things like throwing the CIA out of Australia. He was um, providing massive increases in welfare benefits. And he was doing things that the powers that be we're not really that much in favour of, i.e. benefiting the the ordinary Joes like you and I. Um, and so he was just simply dismissed. He was he was dismissed from office by the Queen and basically put um, another guy in who they did approve of. So, you know, if people ever say to me the politicians have power or prime ministers have the ultimate power, then... You know, I use that example often to tell people, to explain to people how that isn't the case. But who would succeed? Well, at the moment, it's Prince Charles, isn't it? Who's our eldest son and the heir to the throne. Um, so, you know, it just it's just a, a dynasty, a, a generational thing, isn't it? And it just goes on. And it's the same, not just in the royal family, but that you can say that's true with the ownership of the banks per se, and the ownership of all the big corporations, it tends to be dynastic, it tends to be generational, and it's the same families all the time that that keep control of everything. And that's another thing. (laughs) These same exact people, they not only control media, energy, and banking, but they also seem to own all of the major corporations as well, which a lot of us work for. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. The whole thing is 
stitched up. <laughs> if you understand what that phrase means, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's an English phrase or whether it's used in America, but it's all, it's all, um, you know, it's all controlled. It's all, everything is tightly knitted together uh, and the whole thing is controlled by the, the, these very few families. They say it's the 1%, but it's not really a 1%. It's the, I would say it's the point zero one percent <laughs> yeah so again just my opinion but that's that's how it goes that's that's the way things are and john when you aren't investigating and researching this control system what else do you like to do do you listen to music are you into movies what are some of your hobbies um yeah i'm I like to do a bit of eating and sleeping occasionally, you know. So, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, I'm, I like sport. Um, I I'm not into movies much because most of movies are <laughs> come from a place called Hollywood, as you know, and that is tightly controlled. And most and most of the movies that we watch, whether we believe it or not, are propaganda. So I tend not to watch that many movies. Just the odd one occasionally, but. Um, yeah, sport, and I read a hell of a lot. You know, not, not just conspiracy stuff, but I read, I read novels and I read um, factual books. So I'm very, very into history, and that, that's what sort of first started me down this road is, is my love of history. Um, you know, and then when I found out about real history as opposed to the manufactured history that we get, um, that you know that sort of piqued my interest even more. So yeah, it's just mainly that reading and sport and uh you know my family we have a good family life and uh, my kids are grown up now and, and gone flown the nest but um you know we do a lot of family stuff uh with with us all together and uh to be honest i don't have that much time other than researching and writing it it seems to take up you know the vast majority of my waking waking life but the nice thing about it is i can have a day off when i feel like it which is great do you have I'll a favorite <laughs> Do you have a favorite yeah. soccer or football team? Uh, yeah, soccer. It's soccer, not American football that I like. Um, it's it's a, a Premier League team called Huddersfield Town, um, which they're, they're, they've just finished bottom of the league and, and they're going to be relegated. Or they're, they're about to finish bottom of the league and they're going to be relegated back down to the division below. But it's been a nice ride for the last two seasons. Um, just a tiny, tiny team. We've been swimming with the big fishers, but Unfortunately, the sharks have eaten us and we're gone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll live to fight another day. And that's probably, in my opinion, the most interesting thing about soccer is the teams will actually, if they do really well, they'll move into a higher bracket and compete with better that's teams. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a whole pyramid, the system. It's, you know, with the Premier League at the top, right down to local leagues, you know, or what you call the little leagues. If there's, if there's a... Um, you know, a village team, for example, who, who does really well, it can actually move up through the pyramid and it can actually it take a long, long time. But in theory, it could actually get to the very top. But of course, like anything else, sport is no exception. Money talks. And, and really, the only way to stay at the top is when you've got backing by billionaires. You know, that's the only way you can do it. And, and certainly Huddersfield Town doesn't have that. So. Uh, you know, like I say, it was a nice ride while it lasted, but we were always punching above our weight, you know. Are your children, are they aware of what's going on out there or do they tend to stick to other things? Again, sorry, I lost you. Oh, I was just asking if your children were aware of all this stuff that's going on or, or, or are they more focused on other things? Um, yeah, I would say they're more focused on, focused on other things, but they know they know the broad picture yeah because i you know i've drummed it into them over the years <laughs> they got a bit fed up of it at times but you know i think they do accept now that uh, dad is talking a little bit of sense you know they, they've done certain things and then they do know what's what's going on although they don't devote their lives to it like i have you know and so similarly with my wife as well when i first got into this she was very skeptical very anti um but again over the years i've fed her stuff that she's looked at and she's she's with me now she realizes that i was right all along which is a nice position to be in and we're now approaching the end of the interview but 
I'd like to kind of open things up one more time. If you'd like to go ahead and get up on the soapbox one more time and say whatever you'd like to say to my audience out there. And please feel free to follow that up with anything you would like to plug, websites, any projects that you're working on, any talks or anything at all that you would like to plug. Please do that now. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's been great talking to you and uh, I've really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say basically that um, if anybody out there is sexually skeptical of what we've been talking about today, and I guess there'll be some people out there who, who perhaps think that uh, it's a load of nonsense or maybe they've already switched off. But yeah, I, I would really, really urge people to look at things for themselves. I always say to people, never take what I say at first face value. You know, I'm not, I'm not always right. You know, I'll be the first to admit that. Um, uh, it, it's absolutely imperative that you look at this stuff for yourself because seeing is believing. You know, listening to someone who you've never met before or you don't know from Adam, like myself, is all well and good. But you really need to get out there and just even if it's just five, ten minutes a day, just research, just go on the Internet, just Google stuff and find. And, you know, and if you can remember anything at all or some of the stuff that I've been saying today, just get out there and Google it and 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 buy my books as well. That might help. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can buy my books on Amazon dot com or Amazon dot co dot UK if you're in Europe um, and just Google my name, John Hamer, and, and my book list will pop up. I also have a website with hundreds of articles on there that I've written over the years, um, which is falsificationofhistory.co.uk. And, you know, my contact details are on that website. If anybody wants to email me, please feel free to do so. You know, even if you just want to tell me what an idiot I am, I don't mind. I get it all the time. <laughs> I'm happy for anyone to contact me at any time, especially if they want any help on any particular topic. That would be uh, in my privilege. Excellent. And I do thank you, John, for joining me. I had a great time. And I would thank you. Yeah, I definitely like to talk to you again in the future. We can catch up with whatever your latest work is and anything that you have on your mind. That'd be my pleasure. Thank you, Daniel. Absolutely. And you enjoy the rest of your day, my friend. Thank you. You too. And that was John Hamer. Excellent guest. I do apologize for some of the sound issues that we were having whenever a guest is located across the pond or on the other side of the world. We tend to have a little bit of trouble with the Skype. It's really the only program that can offer this type of connection that everybody seems to have. I know there's other stuff out there, but everybody seems to be on Skype. Everybody seems to have it. And it actually works the best out of what's out there i found so um, occasionally when somebody's located really far away we'll have some echoing issues and things like that but i just do my best to work around it i tried to talk a little slower so my questions got in there and hopefully you guys heard all of what john had to say i don't think his words were echoing at all so i would say all in all a successful broadcast especially considering the distance i know i had a lot of fun with that but we're going to go ahead and take our usual break after the interview. I invite you to come back after the break and listen to what I have to say. I've been gone for a while, and there's a lot going out there. Ugh, a lot going on out there in the world. Too much coffee, sorry. A lot going on out there in the world. A lot I'd like to talk about. A lot going on in my personal life, and I will get to all of that stuff after the break.
hello and welcome back to these end of days, these last days, the final countdown to extinction, the toxification of our waters, the pollution of our skies, the brainwashing of every child. Yes, here we are in these dystopian times called the end of days. I'm your host, Daniel, broadcasting to you. From an underground base, getting dissected by a mantis scientist while I broadcast here on air. Oh, <laughs> I know, I know. Daniel, where have you been? Where have you been? What can I say? Life has been hectic. Life has been brutal. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a show or maybe these things just happen, but I've been bombarded by a lot of shit. I've got a lot stacked on my shoulders. I've got a lot going on in my head. I don't know if this is the forces of darkness trying to stop me, trying to suppress me, trying to break me down into nothing. I can only assume. But like a famous man named Nietzsche once said, that which does not kill me only serves to make me stronger. I'm stronger. Krom. Krom is with me. You guys know who Krom is, right? Have you seen Conan? Conan, the most badass dude of all time. Like, if you think, if you think uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a badass, or if you think Wolverine is a badass, these guys have got nothing on Conan the Barbarian. Ooh, wait, what did I just say? Hold on. Arnold Schwarzenegger played Conan. What am I even saying? That doesn't make sense. But in any case, Conan's a freaking badass. Go read the old Conan books. Read the comics by Marvel and Dark Horse. I love Conan comics. I could read Conan comics all day long. Just sit there with my bong and a stack of Conan comics. I can escape reality and go into my own world of Hyboria. That's where Conan lives, Hyboria. Okay, I'm getting extremely off the nerd deep end, and I should just stop, right? Because y'all out there are like, what's he talking about? Who's this Conan? And like one out of a million is like, yeah, Conan! <laughs> like the world's biggest Conan fan is out there. Yeah, go Daniel! Talk about Conan! Conan the Barbarian! And you know what's funny about Conan? Not to go on and on about this, but he always seemed to kind of be doing the same things, yet it's still entertaining. Like, He's always trying to fight off some evil wizard and fight some huge monstrous creature while this chick, this woman in a thong is just watching and waiting to be rescued. Like somehow the monster always finds a human woman to hide in his cave or abduct and Conan has to go and save her. But I remember in some of those Conan comics, he was just taking on whole armies of people like he gets shot by arrows and just shrug it off and just keep coming. See, Conan was from a tribe called the Sumerians. And the Sumerians were like these badass sort of people that just lived out in the wild. And only the strongest would survive. And he'd just go around just fucking everything up throughout all the lands. If you're a fan of Conan, if you love Conan, then remember... Hit me up at Daniel End of Days Radio at gmail.com. Go to endofdaysradio.com, of course, as well. And tell me how much you love Conan the Barbarian. I know they tried to make another movie a few years ago, but it wasn't really quite as cool as the old one. Oh, and also, I do need to apologize. I was getting a little mixed up. At the beginning of our program, I called John Hamer's book, The Falsification of Reality, Our Distorted Reality, Oh, I mispronounced it. I didn't mispronounce it, but I said it wrong. It's actually the falsifi the falsification of history, our distorted reality. So I do apologize for that. I have to do a little correction there. The falsification of history, our distorted reality. Go check that out. Very cool book. <clears throat> and as I explained before the break, we were having some sound issues, so I apologize for that. But I think we got all the information we needed to out there. So not a huge deal. Um, <laughs> I did want to talk a little bit about 
Bohemian Rhapsody. You know, the big movie with Rami Malek about Freddie Mercury and the band Queen. I was always a big fan of the band Queen, like even when I was a kid. The movie Wayne's World came out and it had that famous scene where they're all in the car and they're rocking out to Bohemian Rhapsody. Johnny Leo, Johnny Leo. They're bobbing their heads. And that was the coolest thing ever at the time. Everybody was talking about that. It was just like the funniest, most in thing was that scene from Wayne's World. And I was a kid at the time and, you know, I didn't know much about music or bands or anything. So anything like that that caught on, I would be like, wow, that's really cool. One of the first cassette tapes I ever purchased or was bought for me by my parents was Queen. It was the uh, Bohemian Rhapsody single on cassette tape. <laughs> and I also had the album News of the world. And I had that on cassette tape, which also happens to be probably one of the coolest album covers of all time. It shows this giant robot killing the members of the band. Just really cool cover. You don't see artwork like that nowadays. I actually happened to find a used copy on CD not too long ago. And I grabbed that right away, but this movie, wow. You know, as many of you know, I hate everything. I hate most movies that come out. I criticize and, and break down everything. I'm extremely negative at times. And I don't have one bad thing to say about this movie. It actually exceeded any expectation that I had. And when I watch movies, I am very picky. Like, I will break a movie down. I am worse than Siskel and Ebert on steroids. That's how bad I am. I'm very picky. And I normally never agree with the mainstream, but this one was a freaking winner. It had everything. Great acting, humor, that concert at the end was just mind-blowing. I absolutely got a huge kick out of it. And I like the fact that they did the Freddie Mercury story and they explained his, his gay lifestyle and, and who he was, whether he was gay or bisexual. I like the fact that they told the story and they made you care about the character, but without doing this in-your-face sort of shock with with too much of the gay kissing and sex scenes and stuff like that. They didn't overdo it like that. They didn't make you feel uncomfortable. They focused on telling the story and getting the message across, which I, I really think is a lot more powerful than just you know throwing certain imagery in people's faces, which you see on a lot of television shows now. You know, there, There's a lot of... Uh, you know, you'll be watching your favorite show and all of a sudden they'll show two guys like making out and having sex and all that. And uh, you, you think like they're trying to kind of accustomate or uh, get everybody used to that sort of imagery. <laughs> but uh, this movie didn't do that. It, it told the story, a, a very famous gay individual, Freddie Mercury. It, it told the story in a wonderful way. It didn't overdo the gay scenes and the finish of the movie, I got on Blu-ray, so I guess, I guess it had a little extra scenes and extra footage on it. The big concert at the end, it was just breathtaking. It's got to be, um, you know, besides the actual concert that happened, it's got to be one of the biggest and greatest moments in movie history, in my opinion. Or it's going to be known as. <laughs> and you don't see that nowadays. You don't see a lot of good movies. They're all garbage. They're remakes, reboots, just stupid ideas. Like this... Chucky movie. I mean, I was never the biggest Chucky fan. I always thought he was scary as hell. Sorry, Jack. Chucky's back. Remember that? But this new Chucky movie, he's not an evil-possessed doll. He's a robot. He's an AI. And as cool as AI and robots are, that's just not scary. It's not scary. Um, a doll that is a computer program gone rogue is not scary. It's neato. It's neat. But scary, no. Is Terminator scary? Yeah, an unstoppable robot coming at you that you can't stop. There is something definitely scary about that. But is it really horrifying type scary? Does it make you want to poop your pants? No. The Terminator never wanted, made me want to poop my pants. It's it's always more like, whoa, cool. Look what he just did. Whoa. He just killed that guy and took his shoes and his gun. Whoa. It's that type of stuff, right? Sorry, just sipping a little more of my coffee. I'm a big coffee guy. I live in Seattle. All I do is drink coffee. Like, the lakes and streams around here, they're not even water. They're all coffee. That's how it is in the Seattle area. We drink coffee 24-7. And I piss and shit coffee as well. 
That's all we have to survive is coffee. Oh, another sip. Mm. It's the devil's brew. The devil's brew. It comes out of the devil's cock. Oh, God, that's sick. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. I don't know where that came from. But Bohemian Rhapsody, check it out if you haven't already. I'm sure everybody's seen it. I'm always late to the party. <laughs> when everybody everybody's always talking about something and I'm like, Ew, I don't care. Ew. That's not fringe enough. Ew. I hate it. Quit talking about that. And then three months later, I'll be like, yeah, this is the coolest thing, guys. You got to check it out. Meanwhile, like everybody's way past it and on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody. There's only a couple movies that I'm really looking forward to. And I do apologize. I know I'm supposed to be talking about conspiracy, conspiracies and aliens, the stuff like that, the supernatural, ghosts and goblins and werewolves. I know I'm supposed to be talking about that stuff, but I'm choosing not to. So what can I say? I mean, doesn't that stuff get a little old after a while? Like, honestly, I mean, of course, that's what this show is about. It's about fringe topics, conspiracy, supernatural, but there's nothing wrong with drifting off of that sometimes. I mean, you got to live your life, too. It can't always be werewolves and vampires and zombies and witches. Witches are bitches. We can't always be talking about stuff like that. I mean, really, like, do you want your whole life to be about... about fringe, conspiracy, paranormal stuff? Isn't that a little one-dimensional? And if you're that hardcore into it, you're going to miss out on a lot of other things, let me tell you. I mean, like, let's say your kids need help with their homework. Are you going to say they need help with their homework because of a... Of a global conspiracy so you're not going to help them because somehow that would be adhering to the man <laughs> somehow that'd be going along with things i mean of course not we got to live our daily lives and we have to work on our relationships and we got to work on family and we got to work on staying in shape and entertaining ourselves and bettering ourselves there's other stuff going on out there that's my only point and it's all connected right like, a lot of people, they're really against sports, especially football. I don't mean footy or soccer. I mean football, football. And I'll say, oh, yeah, the Seahawks game it was great, blah, blah, blah. Why are you watching that? Don't you know that's all a manipulation? Don't you know those team names are infecting your brain with mind control? What's a Seahawk? They want you to see a hawk? Oh, a hawk represents power and they're in control? See how they're brainwashing you? No, no, it's just, it's just a game. It's okay to watch a football game. It's okay to get your mind off the woo every once in a while. It's healthy for you. For Christ's sake. And I do believe in Christ. For Christ's sake. Get your mind out of the gutter every once in a while. Peoples. My peoples. I'm not saying quit researching. I'm not saying quit being an activist. I'm saying there's nothing wrong with branching out a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Be well-rounded. Like in MMA, you know how they say you got to be well-rounded? You got to have the boxing and the judo and the Muay Thai and the jiu-jitsu. You have to have everything, right? You can't just be one or another. Otherwise, someone's going to find a hole in your game and they're going to exploit it and you're not going to do very well. That's why they call it mixed. Well, what we need is mixed martial conspiracy or mixed martial supernatural. We got to like... You know, we got to be well-rounded, and we got to hit all the facets. And and your mind can't be negative; it can't be in the gutter all day. You got to think positive, even if it is the end of days. Mmm, sweet coffee, sweet holy juice. <laughs> okay, so this is off-topic again. Don't worry, we'll get back into the woo. But <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, just for kicks, um, a few years ago, as many of you know, do you remember when I was talking about dating apps and all that stuff and how I gave it a try and it was really awful and pathetic and I'd never go into those dating apps? You like Tinder and um, some of the other ones. Tinder. What's the other one? Bender or... <laughs> I already forgot what they were called. There's another one I was on that was like a bunch of like college students and stuff like that. I can't remember what the hell it was. <laughs> but uh, another one was called the uh, Plenty of Fish 
plenty of fish and they had their own app and everything and like I hadn't even looked at it in years and years and I was just curious so I went back in there and somebody had like hacked my account and stolen my identity <laughs> it was like this African dude like I look I look at and I go into my pictures and I see this I see this African guy like that's not me and he's got this whole profile made up and he's using my account to talk to all these American women. And I can only assume that he's trying to get a green card. So this African guy, he must be good with computers. Like how else would he pull all this off? He hacked into my account and he's like having all these really lame conversations with like 50 different women. And no offense to you ladies out there, but these were not attractive women. Like, Either she had a, a googly eye or a pig nose or, you know, four chins or, you know, there's always something. <laughs> there's a reason why they're on there is what I'm saying. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. But this guy, he's just gr this greasy little fucker. He's like trying to hit up all these American women and he's just saying the same lame things like over and over like, oh, hello, how are you? you you're pretty. It's just so disgusting. And the fact that he's using my account to do that. Like, I want to track this guy down. And I want to yell at him and say, hey, don't use my account to talk to unattractive women. That's not okay with me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> How would you feel if you went into your account and you saw a different person's face in there. And they were chatting up a bunch of women that you wouldn't ever go near. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> and not that I'm particularly picky. I'm not that picky. I mean, I actually prefer a woman that has a little bit of, you know, chubbiness or a little bit of meat on her bones. Like, who doesn't, right? What what full-bodied, full-blooded American male doesn't like a little junk in the trunk, right? And if you don't like it, there's no way you're a real American. You must be some kind of European or something, or you have some kind of fetish for skinny people. But I, it's not like I'm that picky. But these women were just, ew, yikes, bottom of the barrel. But they need loving too. So hopefully it works out for our friend, our African friend. Hopefully he finds his green card and comes to the amazing United States. I'm sure it'll be like a dream world for him because uh, those countries are so bad that even living in some shitty ghetto here is better than having to beg for water over there. That's a problem a lot of them have. They don't have medical treatment. They don't have water. And as bad as some of our work benefits are, our health benefits, at least we have them, right? At least some of it's paid for. At least we can go and get our wounds stitched up and get our insides checked out and make sure we're not pregnant or we don't have cancer or anything like that. This is America. You get that stuff. I mean, it's all I've ever known. I didn't grow up particularly wealthy or anything like that. But, yeah, I've always had clean water. I've always been able to take a shower. I haven't had those problems. But they do. That's why they want to come here. It's true. Uh, <laughs> Cobra Kai is coming back. One of my favorite shows. The YouTube exclusive follow-up to the original Karate Kid movies starring... Daniel LaRusso and Johnny. <clears throat> and they've got Crease on the second season. You know, the, the teacher, the enemy deserves no mercy. And that's huge. I mean, that guy is uh, iconic. His role as Crease in the Karate Kid series is iconic. So I'm really excited to see them see them do the second season. Everybody's going to be talking about it. It'll be the next big thing, of course. Another thing that's coming up... Ugh. Again, talking about stuff that a lot of you probably don't care about. Let me check the app for how many fucks I give. It's still at zero. Okay. So, WrestleMania is coming up. Exciting, huh? Uh, WrestleMania is the Super Bowl of the wrestling world, of pro wrestling. It's associated with names like Andre the Giant or Hulk Hogan. Everybody knows who those two are, are right? Worldwide. Worldwide, people know who Tom Cruise are, Mel Gibson, Julia Roberts, and even more people know Hulk Hogan and Bruce Lee because 
Hulk Hogan's beyond celebrity. He's beyond anything like that. He is more like a legend than a celebrity. And once you get to that level and people living in little villages in Africa know who you are, that's when you're that's when you've really made a mark. I know that Hulk Hogan isn't exactly the nicest guy. I know he's done some rather perverted things that were caught on video. <laughs> As well as just being a nasty person in general, he's really buried a lot of young talent and done things of that nature. But I'm excited about WrestleMania. I have to say, it's kind of bringing me back a little bit. I've been really down and depressed. I wish I could share more about what's been going on, but I want to respect the privacy of of uh, myself. <laughs> so I don't want to talk too much about it, but... I got to admit, WrestleMania, it is raising my spirits. It's bringing me back a little bit. I just love wrestling. I love everything that goes into it. The way that a wrestler can get over, they call it, where a wrestler becomes popular. And they learn how to work the crowd and come up with these little gimmicks that catch on and spread like wildfire. And it eventually starts to infect the mainstream. I love that stuff. There's so much in there. If you can understand wrestling, you can understand politics, you can understand how the world works, you can understand the manipulation of the masses, because that's what they're doing in the ring. You know, they're, they're playing two sides against each other, getting everybody invested and everybody interested. They're using a form of magic, in my opinion. They're infecting the global consciousness with these ideas. Like, you guys remember the term laying the smack down? That came from pro wrestling. That came from The Rock. And now everybody says that. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay the smack down. I'm going to lay the smack down. That's from wrestling. Or that suck it thing where you take your hands and slap them against your crotch. You go, suck it. Like, you were seeing that in football games. You were seeing that everywhere, worldwide. That is the power of pro wrestling. Whether you hate it or you like it, you know. A lot of these guys make fun of, oh, those guys are pretending to fight, and they're running around in tights, and blah, 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 it's so gay, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you know, I don't care about the naysayers, or the critics, or people that don't like pro wrestling, because it's awesome. And these people that criticize say, oh, they're not really fighting, blah, blah, blah. Are you really fighting? Are you going and fighting in an MMA ring, or a cage, or something? Or do you just watch it while you sit on your leather sofa? <laughs> right? And these guys are getting hurt in the ring. You better believe it. And pro wrestling is just as dangerous as MMA. It's just as dangerous as football or anything else. These guys are jumping from tall places, slamming each other around, hitting each other with objects. There's injuries happening all the time. Guys being forced to retire. And women now, too. The women's wrestling thing is huge. It just so happens that this WrestleMania, the main event is going to be all women. It's going to be a three-way between Charlotte Flair... Ric Flair's daughter, Becky Lynch, who's huge right now. She's like a, a ph phenomena, definitely the most popular female wrestler, po possibly the most popular wrestler, period, right now, which is amazing. And Ronda Rousey, one of the biggest names in sports entertainment of all time, definitely the most accomplished female fighter that's been around yet, a household name. So this is a very big match. And, of course, the... Uh, Lesnar main event is going to be uh, Brock Lesnar, who you all know, wrestling Seth, Seth Rollins. A lot of you guys probably aren't familiar with Seth Rollins, but he's one of the high flyer guys. Great wrestler, great in-ring performer. Definitely recommend checking out his work. And that's all going, that's going down this Sunday. By the time you hear this, it'll probably be over, but... Um, you know, wrestling has its problems. A lot of people say it's not what it used to be, but I still get excited about it. I'm excited about this WrestleMania. It brings a bit of magic and happiness into my life during dark times, which I need right now. Let's face it, I need it. I needs it. Oh, hold on. Let me get another sip of this coffee. And then we'll talk about something weird for you people that are going crazy right now. Okay, so... Another thing I wanted to touch on, Flat Earth. No, no, not that, of all things, not that, no, it's not flat, you're an idiot. But seriously, Flat Earth, 
Have you guys been tuned in? Have you been paying attention to how crazy this has been going? Have you have you seen the growing number of people out there on social media talking about flat earth? They're shutting it down now. I hope you know that. Um, the big companies in control of the internet, not going to name any names, because then they come after you, of course. <laughs> But the big names, they're trying to censor Flat Earth. They're so threatened by Flat Earth, they're actually removing it from search results. They're censoring it. They're erasing it. They don't want this information to get out there. And the Flat Earth movement in general, it is growing like wild wildfire. It's like everybody's jumping on the bus. Everybody's jumping on this bus, this Flat Earth bus. Why is that? Are all these people stupid? Are they just copying each other? Are they just getting convinced by something nonsensical and wrong? Are they being brainwashed into believing something's not true? I don't think so. I don't think it's any of that stuff. What I think it is, the earth is flat. And if you make certain arguments to a person, they're going to think about they're going to think about the concept in general, which they probably have never questioned. They've probably never really put it to the test in their own mind and asked themselves the hard questions. And once they do, they realize, what am I actually going on? How do I know that the Earth is a globe? How do I know any of this is true? And once you get there, it opens up a world of possibility. If something you are told is told to you, and you cannot verify it with your own senses. And even in the microscopic world, I suppose you could say that we can verify stuff by doing certain experiments and using microscopes and stuff like that. You just can't really do that with the Earth and with space. Like, how do you really know? How do you really know that the Earth is flat, that it's, I mean, the Earth is round, that it's spinning, that we're flying through space? There's just some obvious things that don't add up. Why does a hot air balloon seem to spin with the Earth's rotation? You would think if it was up in the air for a day, it would land in China, or China would at least go underneath it at some point, right? A lot of anomalous things that just don't add up at all. And then people point out, well, Daniel, if there's one satellite out there, then that renders the whole flat Earth thing obsolete. There can't even be one satellite out there. The thing is, though, how do we know that there is? It seems to me that there's a lot of technology out there that contradicts the idea of satellites, like the concept of bouncing radio signals or bouncing signals off the ionosphere. The ionosphere is part of our atmosphere around the Earth. And if we're using technology to do that, why would we need satellites, right? It doesn't quite add up, right? And then you have all these things like satellite radio, satellite TV. Like, they got to put the word satellite there. Do you think that it's really because there's satellite technology involved? Or could the people that own everything just be slapping that on there? to further hypnotize us into believing in this thing called space and these things called satellites. I don't know. It begs a lot of questions, but look into it. Look into this technology of broadcasting signals and bouncing them off the ionosphere, and then ask yourself, if there's satellites up there, why would we ever have to bounce anything off the atmosphere? Because we'd just be bouncing them off of satellites, right? Roy, even Sirius Satellite Radio, if you look into it, there's a lot of stuff that, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff you probably don't know. Like a lot of the signals that you receive are actually coming from ground-based repeaters. A lot of that signal is going through just normal land-based antennas, just like normal radio. So when you hear, oh, satellite radio, satellite radio, it might not even be a satellite signal that you're getting. It might just be a ground-based repeating antenna and you're basically paying like 20 something bucks a month for something that's not even what they say that it is. So where's all that money going, right? Speaking of satellite radio, 
I've I've been kind of getting into Howard Stern a little bit again. As many of you know, huge I'm a huge Howard Stern fan. Um, you know, along with Art Bell. I'm not gonna say coast to coast because nowadays the the term coast to coast is associated with that other guy. But Art Bell, uh one of my heroes, a legend, and I'll always shout him out and always pay tribute. And also Howard Stern. There was a time when I used to listen to Howard for like four hours a day, every day. And that was up until maybe five to seven years ago when it just became harder and harder for me to listen because I was getting so busy. I was also discovering all these different podcasts out there and doing my own show. And, you know, I started listening to other things. Like I listened to the uh, Danny Bonaducci radio show quite a bit. And if I'm listening to Howard for a big chunk of the day, you know, Howard's still the best and greatest, of course, but I just didn't really have any time to explore all these other podcasts and things like that. And the show has, like, honestly, it has slowed down a little bit. It's not quite so hysterical and (laughs) extreme as it used to be. I'm sure even Howard would admit that a little bit. But I've been getting back into it a little bit, and mainly because I've been coming across the videos on YouTube. And there's some pretty interesting concept, uh, pretty interesting stuff up there. <clears throat> Content is what I was trying to say. But apparently, the biggest news is Howard's writing a new book. It will be his third book. Uh, the first one was Private Parts, where they based the movie off of. You know, a huge inspiration to me as a, a wannabe uh, disc jockey or a internet radio host. A huge inspiration for me as well as just listening to his show and the way that he would do things. He would control what's going on uh, like, a, a, you know, the guy that controls the musicians and the band, the orchestra, the conductor. He's Howard is like a conductor. The way that he could make anything funny and just bring on normal people on his show and make them hilarious and, and take his staff in the back and turn them into these stars it just says so much and it shows what a person can do basically with nothing. If they're really determined and they really have the drive there. And also he's just a hilariously funny guy and and the combination of things have made him really the uh, king of all media and the, the greatest broadcaster and radio that there ever was really. And I did pre-order the new book and I have been checking out more of Howard on uh, YouTube, but they got this one guy on there. His name's Manette, and he's, like, one of the staff members from the back. And they're just – Howard's putting this guy on way too much. I mean, this guy's a douchebag, and I swear he's on all the freaking time now. And I think it's really kind of uh, bringing the show down a little bit. So if I could put a little bit of criticism out there as well during my hour-long – butt kissing of Howard Stern, I would have to say they really need to cut back on that Manette guy because he's a freaking douchebag and he just constantly sucks up to Howard and it's like he's his little pet and you're not hearing a lot of the other guys as much. Like, you're not hearing Benji. I thought Benji, Benji Bronk was hilarious. I thought he was just like a genius as far as the comedy and the jokes that he'd come up with and some of these stunts that he's done. Or JD or Richard or Sal. I want to hear more of those guys and less of Manette. That's just my opinion. I'm sure many would agree, disagree. And many of you out there probably don't even listen to Howard Stern, but I just wanted to go ahead and say that. Uh, This is big news. You guys are going to like this. As many of you are aware, like the last show that we did, we did a roundtable show. I'm tired of just... I'm tired of churning out these interviews. It's not enough for me. That's just the truth. I know many of you consider me to be like the greatest interviewer, the best interviewer out there. And, you know, part of that is because I've really studied Howard Stern and I've studied how he does his interviews. To me, he's the guy to look at for how how you do an interview. He's the best interviewer in the world. Like, you know, of course I'm number two, but Howard's the best and, a lot of my inspiration and know-how comes from him. I'll say that right now. And I know a lot of you guys probably aren't going to like to hear this. I think the majority will like to hear this. 
but I'm going to branch out from just doing these interviews and doing the show in the same format all the time. I want to explore more roundtable shows, which I think you hardcore, hardcore fans are going to absolutely love. We're not going to do them all the time. We're still going to do the normal show with interviews and all that. But I'm going to diversify. And by diversify, I mean something really specific. And I've probably brought this up a few times and toyed around with it a little bit. But I want to introduce video content. Like something for you guys to actually see. And I haven't quite hit the nail on the head yet. I haven't quite figured out exactly how I want to do it, but I think that if I can get certain ideas out there in a different way, I could touch a lot more people. And I think you hardcore fans of the show would just appreciate there being some kind of other type of content out there and to be able to see and follow the work that I'm doing here in a different way. I think that's going to have a lot of appeal and mostly it's going to be fun for me because I can't just keep doing the same thing. I got to be creative. I got to branch out. I've got to explore different avenues. If I'm, if I'm getting bored with something then I know you guys out there are getting bored. I mean, we've pretty much interviewed everybody by now, right? Of course there's these new faces popping up all the time, <clears throat> but I think that this show has a lot of potential and there's a lot more things that can be done with it. And I intend to do those things at some point or another. But what I want to explore next is video, and I don't mean just sitting in a studio and ranting about, you know, doing these Alex Jones-style rants. No, fuck Alex Jones. I'd never do anything like that. Alex Jones sucks. He's not entertaining. He's not funny. He's just an idiot. And there's nothing at all good or cool or entertaining about him. I don't even like talking about him because it's just giving him more publicity. He just sucks. He's zero. He's awful. He shouldn't even have any platform. He's not even real. He's an agent. He's he's being paid by the same people we talked about earlier, the people in control of the global conspiracy. And if you promote Alex Jones and you're for him, then you are for the system. You are for the conspiracy. And you you are aiding and abetting and spreading disinformation. So tune out from that Alex Jones shit. I'm not saying you got to listen to me or follow me, but... You know, look at the real stuff. Pay attention to the real stuff. Don't let Alex Jones make you look like a dumbass talking about gay frogs and Y2K and Russian missiles. He's he's the... Wait, what what was I talking about again? Alex Jones? Oh, <laughs> that's right. So I'm not going to do like these Alex Jones style rants, right? It's going to be a little bit different than that. You, of course, will probably do some in-studio stuff, but I want to go out and about too. I want to go and explore some of these actual areas where this stuff is going on. I want to go out and talk to people. I want to meet people and shake hands and be friendly and look them in the eye, knee to knee, eye to eye, as the Japanese would say. I want to actually have some visual proof of some of these things. Maybe some of the symbolism out there, um, some of these social political movements going out on the street. I'm just going to go out there and say, you guys are just fucking stupid. What are you protesting? You're just protesting what they want you to protest. And I'm going to see what they have to say about that. And I'm going to find out how, how much people out there actually know about this stuff. And I'm going to go out there and I'm going to educate them. I'm probably going to have things thrown at me. I'm probably going to be attacked. Hopefully I catch it all on camera. You know, somebody punching me in the face pissing on me and I'm there smiling because I'm a martyr. Oh yes, abuse me, abuse me, piss on me, slap me, poke me with things, <laughs> poke me with sharp sticks and objects. It'd be great, right? It'd, it'd get a lot of attention to the show and it'd get certain ideas out there. And somebody, uh, the real thing needs to be out there. There's all these disinfo agents, Mark Dice, Alex Jones, David Icke, Wendy Williams, <laughs> People like that, right? Just kidding. Wendy Williams is just a nutcase. She's not a disinfo agent. But most of these people are. Linda Moulton Howell, Stephen Greer, Jordan Maxwell, who admits it pretty much. Disinfo. It's all disinfo. We know it's disinfo. Somebody needs to go out there and do the real thing. There needs to be a real hero out there. A real hero. Not a fake comic book hero. Not that there's anything wrong with comic books, but somebody needs to do it for real. 
N- enough of this disinfo. What we need is a spear, a spear of truth, a spear named Daniel, who will plunge into the darkness and tear through the disinformation, tear through all the lies. Open your eyes as we tear through the lies and we synthesize something new and different. That's what this world needs. And I see people out there kind of trying to do it and I will work with them. I'm not trying to compete with them. That would be asinine. That would be counterproductive. What I want to do is I want to work with all of you out there. And I already have been. If you haven't noticed, half of what I do is helping other people promote their shit as selfless as that is of me being a huge hero. As selfless as that is of me, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm working with others. I'm working hand in hand. I'm helping young folk get started with their various platforms and things like that. And I'm not going to do stuff for you. I'm not going to fish for you. That only feeds you for a day. I'm going to teach you how to fish. And then you can eat for life. You can have all the delicious tapeworm-filled fish that you've ever wanted. And you can go up to the dock and fish for yourself anytime. I seek to be a fisher of men, not a fisher of fish. A fisher of men. And not in a gay way, in a helpful spiritual way. A fisher of men. And women as well. Got to throw that in as well for the feminists. And I don't mean women with an E. I mean why man with a Y. Because I am progressive. I am a liberal feminist. And I do relate to everybody out there. Whether they're conservative or liberal or male or female or black or white or Jewish or Christian or Muslim. Or if you're a Christian Jew like me. If you're a Christian Jew and you know what's true then you agree with the words that I spew. Thank you. (laughs) Shout out to all my fellow Christian Jews out there. Oh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, okay. Back off the fringe, back into the matrix. (laughs) Uh, I'm only really excited for a couple different movies. One would be the new and next Avengers movie, the conclusion to the Infinity War saga. It's going to be called Avengers Endgame. Really hyped for that. Oh, really hyped for that. I love comic books. I love all of it. I love Thanos. Thanos. Not Thanos. Thanos. Thanos is one of the greatest villains ever. I was thinking that Thanos was a badass and was really cool long before he was in the movies and anybody knew who he was. So I'm excited about this. And I hope I hope the Hulk gets some payback. Thanos really beat the shit out of him in the first one. He just worked him over doing some MMA shit or something. And it was kind of sad to see the Hulk go down like that. I mean, the Hulk realistically should be a little bit of a better fighter than that. He should be coming back and, you know, in a contest of physical strength and brutality, he should do better than that. That's why I'm a little annoyed the way that he got job to Thanos, Thanos, in the first one. So really excited about that. The other one is Godzilla. Godzilla. I love Godzilla movies. I'm a huge Godzilla fan. Um, I believe Godzilla is real. I believe that he's a real entity out there. And, um, you know, he will be showing himself in the future. But until then, I'm going to watch the movies and enjoy them. I love the the old ones, like the first ones and the middle ones that came out in like the 90s and then the modern ones and then the American one. I even love that shitty American Godzilla from 1998. You know, the one with the Rage Against the Machine song for the soundtrack and Matthew Broderick, who's also a badass, I should add, Matthew Broderick. Probably one of the toughest dudes around. We're talking about Ferris Bueller here. But I even love that movie. I love anything Godzilla. I love anything Aliens and Predator too. I eat that stuff up. Any Aliens or Predator movie, no matter how shitty it is, or any Terminator movie, I've seen all of them. I will see all of them. I eat that shit up. I don't care how bad it is. It's just the concept is so cool. How could I resist? 
<laughs> there's a lot of uh, old shit out there from the 80s and 90s that a lot of you young folk probably don't even know about. Like, there's a really cool 80s movie. I think it's from the 80s. It might be early 90s, but it's called Hardware. And it's about this robot that's just... I don't know what's going on with him. He's malfunctioning. He's tripping on acid or something, but he's just going around killing people. And he actually he actually hits him with a hallucinogen before it kills him, which makes that movie even cooler. Uh, let's see here. Politics are awful and boring. I don't even want to talk about politics anymore. Uh, I can't even stand it for two seconds. I see it on Twitter. I just tune it out. People talk about politics. I just flip the discussion and start talking about Illuminati. I can't talk about politics. I hate politics. Um, I don't care what Donald Trump is doing. Fuck Trump. Fuck Alex Jones. Fuck Trump. Fuck Hillary. I don't care about anything that they have to say. I'm voting for Adam Kakesh. Adam Kakesh is my candidate of choice. That's the only thing I care about as far as politics go. And... Fucking Trump can suck my dick, and so can Hillary. I bet she'd want to. She'd probably bite it off and eat it. Politics is boring. It is. Rather talk about the new Godzilla movie. Um. Oh, shout out. Uh, let's see here. Hold on. I know this is unprofessional, but I'm not professional, so it doesn't matter. Uh, I have a... I have a... Letter from a listener, uh, first name Leroy. Hi, Daniel. I've been listening to your Archive podcast for the last few weeks now. They are pretty awesome. As Todd said in your last podcast, fuck the Joe Rogan show, <laughs> or words similar to that. I am from the UK and around your age. I was just wondering if you are live tonight. Well, I'm live right now, Leroy. And I appreciate you listening. Um, looks like he gave a little shout out to the Todd man out there. It made him laugh. For whatever reason, the show has tons of fans in the UK. Like, it really appeals to people over there. I don't know if it's my sense of humor or what. <laughs> but I seem to have almost as many fans over there as in this country, which is odd. But I don't mind it. I, I kind of dig it. I mean, if you all got, like, a cousin or sister or something like that who's at least a 7.5. I really dig those British accents, so, you know, introduce me. <laughs> preferably, like, 5.7 to 5.8 and blonde, preferably. <laughs> uh, just got to put that out there. Ooh, hello, ladies. Ooh, hello. Mackin, Mackalackin. Uh... I also, uh, I wanted to talk about this, but it's so depressing and personal. All right, let's do it. You know what? Before we get into that, let's do the mind-blowing moment of the day. <sighs> Give me an instrument. Give me something. Give me something. Oh, oh, I see a recorder over there. I suck so bad at playing this shit. Mind-blowing. Mind blowing. Mind blowing. Mind blowing moment of the day. Okay, so the mind blowing moment of today, I would say, was when our guest, John Hamer, excuse me, shout out to him, very nice man, uh, he told me something that I have never heard before, and that is that. The queen actually pulled some strings and showed exactly how much power that she has when she when she uh, pulled the carpet from underneath that Australian. Was he a prime minister, a politician down there? She didn't like what he was doing. That was definitely mind-blowing. I mean, besides all the other stuff, which is equally mind-blowing, but I had no idea anything of that sort happened. That just blows my mind. He's blowing my mind, man. My eyeballs are popping out of my head. That's how powerful this information is. Oh, my. But, uh... Oh, this chair's so squeaky. Besides that... What I wanted to talk about was change. 
I wanted to talk about change. And this is something I think that everyone, every single one of you out there, you know, unlike wrestling or this obscure stuff that I'm into, everybody out there, or Dragon Ball, love love Dragon Ball, everybody can relate to change and how tough change can be. For whatever reason, my life has been changing like crazy lately. I'm somebody that has a little, you know, I get a little anxiety sometimes and I get stressed out. I probably have a little bit of obsessive compulsive disorder, but change just drives me through a loop. Like it makes me so mental. It makes me so mentally insane when everything is just changing around me like a circus or a merry-go-round or a roller coaster. It's just like, ooh, this is changing around me. People are moving on. People are moving in. My settings are changing. My life is changing. My perspective is changing. Just everything is just changing so much. It's almost like a transformation. And it's extremely hard for me to deal with. And I don't know why these things happen. I don't know if this is God just mixing things up for me every once in a while because I'm supposed to be doing something different. Like I've, I've accomplished whatever I needed to accomplish within this little bubble of my timeline. And now it's time to move on to the next thing. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's God just deciding for me what's really best for me beyond my own scope. Like what I, can comprehend. Perhaps that that's what it is. That that is actually what I believe it is. I believe it's something out there. I call it God, the source that is causing me to have these experiences. Like a lot of people they say you create your reality, you generate everything that's happening to you. I I do believe that to be true, but it's almost like a multiple choice, choose your own adventure where you are given certain choices. I think everybody can agree on that. We're given certain choices and we can go left or we can go right. If we go right, it takes us here. If we go left, it takes us there. And it's hard to know what to do sometimes. Should I take this job? Should I text this person? Should I, should I drive to this place? Should I move here? Should I do this? You hear a lot of that stuff out there. And how do we know if it's the right choice or not? Do we listen to our logic and reasoning? Do we draw it all up on a diagram? How do we know what is the right choice for us and for me and for you? How do we know what we should do? I try to listen to my heart and listen to my gut and do what I know is right. But the more hectic things become, the more complicated, the harder it is for me to really know that. And I feel like that's what life has been doing to me lately. It's been really testing me. It's been putting me through some pretty harsh traumatizing situations that have just ripped me from the world of conspiracy and fringe and paranormal and just brought me back into that base reality of just everyday life and family and friends and forgiveness and, and basic things that at the end of the day comprise a lot more of your world, even though it's all connected, but these things comprise a lot more of your world than you know, what the aliens are doing or what Lucifer's doing lately, <laughs> what the Illuminati are doing. You know what I mean? Not that it doesn't affect us extremely. I mean, we were all there during 9-11. Uh, we all have so much money in the bank, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, besides that, the things that are within our power to change on a daily basis, you know, what's really in front of us, That's that's so important. And you can't lose sight of that. And, and that's what I think really happened to me. I I grew up as somebody that I didn't have a lot of friends. I was a loner. I became this huge rebel. It was just anti-everything against the grain and every aspect of my existence. Just a true outcast, a misfit, a rebel. And it almost caused me to lose touch with certain things that a human shouldn't lose touch with. Like the empathy and love a person should have in their life. While I'm exploring the nether regions, I'm missing out on the local regions. And it's not that you shouldn't explore those places, but it takes a certain type of individual 
to be able to handle it. If your life is already awful already and you hear that there's an Illuminati out there, then it's like, well, <laughs> at least everybody's a part of this big shit storm, right? You kind of think like that a little bit and you kind of think like if somehow I can defeat this Illuminati or, or outsmart this Lucifer or avoid getting butt probed by these aliens, somehow things will work out for me. But that's not the truth. That's not reality. It's not about that. It's about living right and being right and doing what you need to do to be happy. And usually that means having some sort of relationship. It means having a family. It means starting a family. It means having those things that might not be important to the masses out there, but things that are important to my life and my happiness and my future. And for me to really be the rebel badass that I want to be, I need to change and I need to open my heart up again. And that's hard for someone like me to do. It is, it really is because I'm so deeply embedded in this world of strangeness, of fringe, of experiencing the impossible and the many, many infinite layers of deception all around us. It can really make it hard for you to just be a normal human being. And if you aren't a normal human being, like I was saying earlier, you tend to seek this stuff out. You tend to be able to handle it better than the neighbors across the street who have been addicted to the mainstream forever and ever and ever. And ever, ever, ever. And ever, ever, ever. <sighs> I told you it'd be depressing. <laughs> but for every down, there's an up. For every negative, there's a positive. And if you're on the downswing, eventually you gotta go upwards because there's no place else to go. So hang in there. Hold on to your bootstraps. Everything is going to be okay. Just don't panic. Isn't that the uh, motto of that book, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? i seen the movie. I never actually read it. I'm sorry. Don't panic. And I don't think that you should panic. And I don't think that I should panic. Because everything's going to be okay. A-OK. -okay. They can kill me. They can stick a cage of rats on my head. 19, 1984 reference there. 1984. Shout out. They can stick a cage full of rats on my head. Until I say, do it to Julia instead. Hey, that rhymed. They can do something like that to me, but they can't really destroy me on that spirit level. The only person that can do that to me is me. It's a matter of choice. And that's the truth at the end of the day. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, do a new story. If I can having trouble bringing it up. <laughs> uh, I do apologize. I'm having a technical difficulty. Maybe we won't. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> this comes from News Punch, where mainstream fears to tread. Hmm, haven't heard of these guys before. Cool. I like that. Cool. Model who accused Italy's prime minister of hosting satanic rituals found dead. Looks like a model who knew a little too much had to be gotten rid of. Oh, jeez. There's something called Ruby Gate going on. You might want to look that up. Let's see. What's this lady's name? Emane Fadil, that sounds like an Arabic or Muslim name, the model who said she witnessed satanic rituals at the Italian Prime Minister's mansion has been found dead under suspicious circumstances. The Moroccan ex-model, oh, she's Moroccan. The Moroccan ex-model became a celebrity after becoming a key witness in the 2013 Rubygate trials, which accused the former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi of child prostitution. 
VigilantCitizen.com reports in 2018, Fidel claimed in an interview that Berlusconi's infamous parties led to dark satanic rituals. She was also in the process of writing a tell-all book about Rubygate and the dark secrets of Berlusconi. The name of the projected book was quite evocative. I Met the Devil. <laughs> Great name. However, in the past weeks, things dramatic turn in the past... What? That must be a typo. Amain Fadil died in a hospital room in Milan on March 1st after a month of agony. Media sources reported her death only 15 days after the fact, mostly because authorities announced the opening of a homicide investigation. Indeed, the cause of Fidel's death is currently believed to be murder by radioactive poisoning. Holy shit. I've heard of that before. That's uh, how the KGB used to kill people. My God. If you look this up and you go to the article, you can actually read a whole interview they did with her. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but <laughs> it's pretty bad. Is that what rich people do? They just use their money to have, like, to, to fulfill their own sexual appetites? It seems to be the case, right? Like, all these super rich politicians and people like that, at some point it is revealed they were visiting an island of sex slaves or they were caught in bed with a transsexual or in a taxi cab with a transsexual or something like that. Right. It always seems to happen. Like that's whatever, that's the reason people want to make all this money so they can, they can use it to just uh, bring about their own personal pleasure. That's very satanic, isn't it? Like the concept of it, it's very like selfish. It's just, you know, crushing and stomping on all these people so I can reach the top so I can really get my rocks off. That's what it's all about, right? Getting your rocks off. That's what these people seem to think. That's not us. I mean, us knowledgeable, wise, spiritual individuals, we don't think that way. But if you only have a certain of your, if you only have the reptilian part of your brain functioning, that's probably how you're going to think, right? To, to look at it that way. But how many things like this are we going to hear about? Like, geez, if you're an attractive woman, if you make certain choices, somehow you wind up in a basement of some rich guy's house while the, there's this big image of Baphomet on the wall and you're dancing around in some kind of loincloth or something. Like, how do you get, how do you get there in life? <laughs> how do you get to that place on both ends? <laughs> like, Ugh. And it's funny because prostitution is illegal, right? But all these politicians and lawmakers and officials, they all engage in prostitution, but privately. And they're breaking the law, but it's okay for them, right? Even at that Bohemian Grove, uh, from what I read, it's actual gay sex, like, like uh, you know... One dude bending over and another guy doing things to him. That seems to be what goes on in Bohemian Grove. Like that's a that's like seventy percent of what goes on there, right? Besides the satanic rituals and all that. That's what it says. Like go look it up. It, it's Alex Jones talks about it. You know, for I don't for whatever that's worth nothing. But. You know, that's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down. Why did they have Alex Jones release this stuff about Bohemian Grove? Why did he do that? <clears throat> Why did they put it out there through him? Is it to kind of distract everybody from finding this information on their own? Because it was already out there. Was it to kind of, uh, you know, put, put this guy out there and have him discover certain things in the public eye and then have him act like a goofball and a complete moron. Um, it's got to be, right? It's got to be something like that. But I, I really think what this world needs is an Alex Jones, but a real Alex Jones. Somebody that's not an O'Brien. O'Brien's the uh, character from the book 1984, the, the fake rebel who's used as a shill to lure, lure in the main characters, and he eventually turns on them. 
I think we need an Alex Jones who's not a backstabber, who's not an O'Brien. We need an Alex Jones that is the real thing. And I don't think you have to have tons and tons of money to do it. The technology out there, anybody can speak to the masses. It's just a matter of are you going to get censored? Are you going to get shut down? Can you do it in a way where they can't do that to you? It's pretty hard. I'm trying. I've gotten a little pushback, very little bit of pushback. As many as you can remember, the uh, William Ramsey, the, the interview about the smiley face killers that were are possibly connected to satanic or Illuminati networks. I did get a little pushback on that one. There's been many times where the power went out when I was about to do a show or the internet went out, things like that. Um, I believe I may have been hit by either electronic weaponry of unknown origins, advanced hidden technology, or some sort of interdimensional, spiritual, ghosty, goblin-y sort of attacks. I believe I've been hit by stuff like that many times, um, as well as my personal life basically being sabotaged. But then how do you know what's just the ups and downs of life and what's the force of evil trying to smash you down into smithereens, right? <laughs> so a lot of it's kind of vague, you know, and um, I, I'd say it's better to lean on the side of not paranoid rather than paranoid, although perhaps being a little paranoid does keep you safe. I think it's good to be vigilant overall. And I believe I am. I believe I am vigilant. Uh, uh, one other thing I want to talk about, this is another sort of, social commentary type of thing. <clears throat> oh, man. I need to start doing more shows again. My, I'm losing my voice. My muscle is becoming weak. More coffee will help. But, uh... Let's see, where was I? So... I, you guys may have noticed that the media, they always have to have somebody to hang... Like, it's usually a celebrity like Roseanne or Mel Gibson saying somebody, something racist, or it's this clown uh, trying to set up this thing where people beat him up, or um, the latest things like this girl in some high school or whatever, and she said something racist on Facebook or something like that. But they're, they always have to have somebody to tear down. There always has to be that distraction in place. There always needs to be somebody to be burnt or crucified in front of everybody else. And this is something that goes back into, like, medieval times, like when they would publicly hang people and burn them and stuff like that. It's like every once in a while, the mob needs to be fed a sacrifice to keep them sedated. Like what are the magic occult spiritual implications of that? Right. What's really going on here? And could it happen to you? Could it happen to you? Could you be the next man to be roasted? Could you be the next drone? Kill the drone. Kill the drone. you seen that, right? The Island with Nicolas Cage. The worst movie ever made. <laughs> Kill the drone. The Wicker Man. Not the Island. The Wicker Man. The Island's something else. The Wicker Man, where they burn him in this giant freaking Wicker Man at the end. It's like what goes on at Burning Man. That's all Burning Man is. You know that Burning Man festival? They're just copying the Wicker Man. That's all it is. Burning Man is the Wicker Man. You go to Burning Man, you're going to the Wicker Man. But that awful Nicolas Cage movie, they they have to do that. They always have to find a Nicolas Cage to burn inside the Wicker Man. You get what I'm saying? Like, whether it's uh, it's uh, Russell Crowe, or it's Tom Hanks, or it's Arnold, or whoever it is, there always has to be somebody to persecute. There always has to be someone to be publicly hanged. You know it's true. And it makes you wonder, could it ever happen to you? Could you ever be this person going through this insane humiliation and basically having everybody trying to come after them? I remember, uh, oh man, it's so sad. It's so sad because this is so true. But school, like kids and bullying and all that, there was always one kid that was just the nerd of nerds that everybody hated, like the most unpopular kid in the school. Like, if there was a most popular person, there had to be the most unpopular person. Like, usually somebody that was, like, they stunk and they had a bad attitude on top of that and, you know, probably ugly and just, you know, not a lot going for them. 
and I and I remember the whole school would pick on this person. And how did how would it feel to be that person to have your whole school and everybody around you just acting like monsters towards you and trying to persecute you and beat you up and do mean things to you and terrorize you all the time? And you hear these stories and you hear about these kids committing suicide and stuff like that. <clears throat> and and why is it that these individuals, these bullies, take part in any of that? And are we doing that as a society when we persecute somebody like Mel Gibson or Michael Jackson? Isn't that exactly what we're doing? Like when we feed into the gossip and the speculation and then we all want to see this person punished or hanged in front of everybody. Isn't that what happened with Roseanne? Admittedly, it was her own doing a certain part of it because she does know how to market herself and she does know how to stay in the spotlight. But perhaps she went too far and she lost her whole show and everything. And now she's fighting. <laughs> she hates Sarah Gilbert, who played her daughter on the show, Darlene. They have a little thing going on. But that's what happened to her. She was the latest person to be hanged and. The people wanted blood, and they were given blood, and she had her show taken away. And uh, you know, she she doesn't need the money. She has a lot of money, obviously, but obviously a very hurtful thing that happened to her at the same time. But watch out, you know, protect yourself. Don't let yourself become the pariah of the workplace, or of the block, or the community, or of your family. You got to be socially aware. You can't let your guard down and just say, I'm going to be the black sheep and that's okay. Because next thing you know, you're being targeted. You got to be smarter than that. You know, just fit in enough so you aren't the one at the end of the stick is what I'm saying. That's a smarter way to handle it. You can be a rebel, but you got to know when and how. That's the art of war. You got to know how to conduct yourself how to blend in so that you can strike at the right times. And being an outcast or a pariah is not going to help you. Not in this case. It's not, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? And sometimes you have to be a little incognito and go outside of yourself and be a character and play a character, be an actor or an actress in order to get what you want. And maybe what you want is a bad thing. Maybe it's a selfish thing. Or maybe what you want is to help the world and help everybody. But you got to learn to blend in. It'll keep you safer. It will help you survive. And that probably goes against a lot of what listeners out there believe. You know, you should be yourself and just let it all hang out. And I do believe that there's truth to that. That is something that we should all do. But don't put yourself out there if it's going to get you killed, if it's going to make people hate you, because you don't want to be the one getting roasted. You don't want to be the Mel Gibson or the Roseanne. You don't want to be the one getting crucified, right? <laughs> or maybe you do. Maybe you want to be a martyr. Maybe you want to be a, a Jesus Christ and be crucified in front of everybody. <laughs> uh, That's pretty much it. Kind of trailed off at the end there <laughs> that means that it's probably time to stop that tends to be when i stop the show a great venture all in all we cover a lot of ground today stay tuned go to endofdaysradio.com stay tuned into all the different channels and ways of getting the show um you know particularly youtube if that ends up being the home of this particular next project but stay tuned for some sort of video content um I have given up on certain ideas if they didn't turn out how I wanted them to, but I have a lot of faith in this because this is something that I've been toying around with and deciding upon for a while now, and I'd like to create a different type of content and learn more about production and, and stuff like that rather than just uh, being an audio program. So stay tuned. I won't release it until I'm confident that it's good, that it's quality, that the listeners out there will like it. But stay tuned. It will be coming down the pipe. And I'm not sure when our next actual podcast or radio show will be. Uh, hopefully sooner than later. I do have a lot of people that are wanting to come on the show. A lot of people I haven't gotten back to. I do apologize. Life has been crazy lately. 
But end of days radio will never die. It'll always come back. It'll be always be on air. Even if you don't hear from me sporadically and things like that happen, know that I am here for you and I'm fighting for you and I'm fighting for what we all believe in, which is freedom and truth. But I'll only do what I feel is right and what my heart tells me to do. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go on air and deliver a subpar program if my heart isn't in it. I'll wait until I feel good about it again. Otherwise, I'm just wasting your time and wasting my time. you got to have the passion. And I'll only broadcast when I have that passion in my heart. If I'm dead inside, then I'll ride it out and wait until I feel a little better because I'm not going to be dead to you, nor would I want you to be dead to me. And remember, one day the dead will rise. Uh, I'm Daniel. This is End of Days Radio. You have a good night.